First of all, let's thank God, the Almighty, for giving us opportunity and blessing so that we can attend this webinar without any trouble at all. And also, I would like to give a very special thank you to our sponsor, English First and Chito Mask, who made this event possible. Before we proceed, there are a few ground rules that we would like the participants of this webinar to follow. Recording in progress. First, all participants are expected to actively join in all sessions of this webinar. Second, please turn on your camera and use the virtual background provided by the committee. Third, please rename your Zoom username according to the following formats. Institutions underscore name. For example, Universitas Airlangga underscore IU. And last, please mute the microphone, especially during the presentation. Next up, we would like to ask all and sing along to our national anthem, Indonesia Raya. To the committee who is in charge, please share the video. the committee. Before we continue, I would like to remind the participant to fill out the attendance form that has already been sent via chat box. Next, Environment, Environment Festival is an annual event held by Student Association of Environmental Engineering Universitas Erlangga. 
This year grand theme is Our Action for Green Cities and Green Society Towards Indonesia 2045. This event consists of five main events, including ISO training, webinar series, poster competition, and focus group discussion for high school students, and also awareness proper webinar. For today's webinar, we have incredible lineup of speakers who are going to give us various insight on water, wastewater, and land management towards SDGs in 2030. The first one, we have Professor Rui Andong. He is the chair professor in the Institute of Analytical and Environmental Science, National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. Next, we have Professor Madia Radin Maya Safira Radin Muhammad. She is the head of Micropolitan Research Center or MPRC, University Tun Hussein On, Malaysia. And last but not least, we have Professor Takasu Fuku. He is the Vice President for International Exchange, Department of Environmental Science, Nara Women's University, Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to listen to the opening remarks delivered by the representative of Dean of Faculty of Science and Technology. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Fatma Wati, Vice Dean of Faculty of Science and Technology, Universitas Erlangga. For Dr. Fatma, the time and media is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Asha. Uh, could you hear my voice? Yes, Doctor, I could hear your voice clearly. Okay. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear Prof. Rui Andong, Chair Professor in the Institute of Analytical and Environmental Science, National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. Professor Madia Radin Maya Safira, Head of Center Micropolitan Research Center, University Tun Hussein on Malaysia. Professor Takasu Fugo, uh, Vice President for International Exchange, Department of Environmental Science, Nara Women University, Japan, lecture students and all participants. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure that I have opportunity to welcome you to the opening the Informant Festival webinar series 2021. Our action for green cities and green society towards Indonesia 2045. This is actually today's webinar on this today, 13 October 2021, for the international webinar and 16 October 2021 for the national webinar. This webinar is our opportunity to demonstrate that transformation is possible and is happening right now in so many places with so many innovation and with engagement of so many people. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to all of the committees from study program of environmental engineering in collaborate with environmental engineering student organization for organizing and conducting this webinar and all of the participants as well for their participation in making this webinar success. Ladies and gentlemen, Many of today's big environmental challenges are connected in cities. Pollution is one of the five main drivers of uh, biodiversity, of biodiversity loss, treating today the survival of more than one million species. Unless we change our ways, uh, this effect will get worse, not better even over time. Our engagement with people is particularly important this year because they will play a central role in the life delivering zero pollution. This engagement will be particularly important for scientific research through a citizen science. Ladies and gentlemen, 
The Green Cities approach aims to transform the city from its prison business as usual scenario to one that will deliver long-term sustainability in all of its aspects, including urban water. The Green City approach also includes establishing an urban management partnership between urban service sector, government, private sector, civil society, and education to provide the stakeholder framework to facilitate a more integrated approach to planning and to enable implementation of the Green City Action Plan. This webinar is going to become the opportunity for development of technology and innovation to reduce pressure and protect the environment toward the green city. Together, let us make this a decade of action, a decade of transformation, a decade of hope and peace. Finally, I would like to wish everyone a successful, safe, and fruitful webinar. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Fatma, for the opening remarks. Next, we are going to listen to the opening remarks from the Head of Comedy Environment Festival 2021. Everyone, please welcome Sultan Fati, Head of Committee and Environment Festival 2021. To Fati, the time and media is yours. Thank you so much, MC. Please wait for my video because my laptop has problems. I'm trying to reconnect. It's okay, Fati, if you couldn't turn on your camera, you could do the opening remarks with uh, off cam. I'm in. Okay, uh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Right. Thank you for the chance. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My Honorable Professor Roy Andong, Professor Madia Radimaya Safira Radi Muhammad, Professor Takasu Fugo, Vice Dean of Faculty Science and Technology, Mr. Fatmawati, our environmental engineering lecturers, dear MC and moderators, and also very every committee and grateful audiences. First of all, I want to say that I am very grateful to be here with every of you, and thank you very much for the whole support. We deeply gratitude for uh, professors to be willing to attend our event as speaker. Our gratefulness are conveys to honorable lecturers, MC, and moderators. Thank you to my beloved committee. We've been struggle on the days before, and today our big day, hopefully and effortfully, could turn into a successful event. I mean, the environment relatively always be a least priority when we were build our economy, our community, our civilization. All fish people still thought that it is normal to sacrifice the nature above economy, politic, even tourism. This issue also happened in our cities. That story is our motivation to create today's webinar series. We do hope in the near future, with our action, me and you, we could change the cities. We could have done several movement and innovation for the environment, for the community. 
a community that is not poison our ocean and not harm our soil. We do hope on this webinar, you could discuss and spark awareness, also knowledge, relieve environmental issues in our cities and make the year 2045 or hopefully earlier to be the year of our environmental blurriness. That's all for me. Thank you for the chance I give to MC. Thank you. Thank you, Fatih, for the opening remarks. Next, we have a little video from our sponsors to the committee who is in charge. Please share the video. Last week, I sent you some homework for going to. Who did the homework? Akmal already did it, yeah? You can open to page seven. Oh, Akmal, you have your book. Very nice. So if you don't have the book, it's okay. You can just write this on your paper. Okay, so which hobby were they talking about? Okay, so is this the answer that you guys got? Yes. Okay, awesome. Good job, everyone. Okay, you all did. Great job. So as we know, English is considered as the global language and today it's actually the most spoken language in the entire world. So if you want to travel abroad, work internationally or simply be able to understand all the latest movies and music, learning English at EF English Language School will lead you down the path you're dreaming of. So what are you waiting for? Register yourself immediately and find out interesting over through EF stuff right now. For further information, please contact to 0813-4335-3258 EF English First Surabaya. Next, we have a few words from our next sponsor. Please, to the committee who is in charge, uh, please share the photo. Okay, maybe there's some trouble, yeah. So I will just, yeah. <clears throat> so everyone, are you still wearing disposable masks that cause pollution or are you wearing regular cloth masks? No comes Cheeto mask, a reusable antimicrobial trendy fabric mask equipped with a Cheeto mask filter from shrimp shells that has antimicrobial activities but still environmentally friendly. Don't worry, even it's antibacterials and environmentally friendly, you can buy Cheeto mask at an affordable price. So go check it out on at cheetomask.filtermasker Instagram account before it protects you and your earth together. Now we are heading to the main events of today's webinar that is discussion and Q&A session. First up, we will have our first speaker of the day, Professor Madia Radin Maya Safira Radin Muhammad from University Tun Hussein on Malaysia. Professor Maya will be accompanied and moderated by Mr. Wahid Dian Budianto. Mr. Wahid Dian Budianto is lecturer in Environmental Engineering, Universitas Airlangga. He got his Bachelor in Environmental Engineering from Institute Technology 10 November. And he continued his master degree with the same major on National Chengfung University, Taiwan. His latest research, who had been published on Pollution Research Journal, talks about the combination of the gas and ketosan as a membrane in elimination of prosthobotic waste pollutant parameters. Now, without any further ado, I will give the stage to Mr. Wahid Dian Budianto as the moderator for the first session. To Mr. Wahid, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the ceremony, for the time for me. Okay, for today, the agenda today, uh, I will deliver you all to the first main agenda, which is will be delivered by Professor Radin Maya. Before we go to the main session, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker. Uh, her name is Professor Dr. Adin Maya Safira in Radin Muhammad. Uh, she is now a lecturer in Faculty of Civil Engineering and Full Environment in University of Tunusen on Malaysia. And now she is uh, Associate Professor of Micropolitan Research Center. 
and also she is the head of um, microbiology center in the UTHM. Her research is all about uh, the worst weather and water treatment. I think it will be related to the, our talk today, correct? Um, and also, you can see that a lot of publication that she was published since a uh, year really long ago and until today. I think he, she will be really, really good talking about the, the theme, the material that she will be shared. Mm. Okay, am I with the Professor Radin Maya now? Uh, yes. Okay. How are you, Professor Radin Maya? I'm good. Good, good. good. Thank you so okay. much. Since, since we met the uh, last two years, right? 2018. Yeah. yeah, in our first international conference also. She also a speaker there and it's a good great job for her yeah. to come here and deliver a very good speaking. So I hope right now she will deliver really, really good the topic and also about this, the material. Okay, I think I will, let's welcome her to the first session. Okay, the time for you, Professor Rajin. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Wahid, eh, for your introduction. So let me uh, share the screen for my presentation. Can you see the slides? No, not yet. Maybe loading, still loading. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's your hoe. We can see the PowerPoint clearly. Okay, let me uh, start, yeah? Now, is it okay? I'm not sure, maybe my line is not okay or what? It seems like a, some delay. Oh, is it okay now? It's okay, it's okay. I think we can see it clearly. Okay, right. We can follow uh, the presentation. To the organizer. That yes, thank you so much uh, uh, for the Mr. Wahid as a uh, chairman for today and moderator and also the organizer. Uh, uh, so, Student Society of Environmental Engineering, UNAM. Okay, actually, uh, if not because of the pandemic, I will... Uh, regularly go to UNEL uh, to go to do some activities eh, like visiting a uh, lecturer, giving a lecture, and then uh, me and also my good friend, uh, Dr. Norina Fitriani, always having a collaboration work with research and uh, supervision and so on. So my name is uh, Buk Maya. I'm from uh, University of Tongsina, Malaysia. Uh, this is uh, in Johor, right? if you are maybe not familiar which part of it in Malaysia. Yeah, but in, in Johor is a southern part of Malaysia near to Singapore. Okay, uh, currently is the head of the Micropolitan Research Center under Faculty of uh, Civil Engineering and Built Environment. Previously, it was known as Faculty of Civil and Environmental Engineering, but we changed because we have uh, another new program, which is uh, uh, architecture. Okay. Uh, so my uh, expertise is on grey water. Uh, I limbah. Uh, from this, what we call that, uh, Monday, okay, laundry, uh, and so on, uh, treatment and reuse, bioremediation, mycoremediation by using microalgae. Recently, I embarked a study on the photocatalysis uh, using the nanoparticles for uh, target pollutants like uh, xenobiotic organic compound and also certain emerging pollutants, uh, water and waste water treatment. So I would like to share with you about the recent trends on the emerging pollutants of concern in wastewater and its effect to water quality, supply quality. So what is the, our way forward to the treatment and also the circular economy? Okay, if uh, uh, you are not, uh, I'm not giving a clear, I mean, uh, in terms of voice and also slide, please let me know. Okay. Uh, so before I proceed, I would like to share to all of you about uh, the locations of uh, our university. Actually, our university is one of the public universities in Malaysia, uh, located in southern part of uh, Malaysia in here. Okay. Uh, if we're taking a flight to Surabaya, it's around two hours. Yeah. 
Okay, this is the location. So this is our big library. It's one of the uh, the big uh, library in the South, I think in Asia. Okay, the, this is the location. Please come over after the borders uh, allow. Okay. And then actually, because uh, now I'm living in Johor, we are much more close to community of Java. Java ni ramai orang Java ya di sini, so uh, I can understand. Uh, um, ni boleh boleh faham ya dengan bahasa Java, but not really good maybe because uh, my ancestors and ni semuanya dari part Indonesia ya. Okay, nak lambat ini <laughs> sebentar ya. Okay, nak move. Okay, so the outlines uh, for today is uh, I would like to discuss on the what is, does it mean by emerging pollutant concern, yeah, emerging pollutant, what is the sources and then the effects, the main parameters of emerging pollutant of concern and its con uh, concern to environment, uh, the treatment, okay, circular economy, what, what does it mean and then what we can uh, derive from the wastewater, uh, let, let's say from the waste to well. To recycling, and then uh, during the pandemic era, era now, now they they say that we need to change to endemic. That means we need to live uh, with this uh, virus, right? And then what does uh, the standards, uh, the current standard of the emerging pollutant in Malaysia, also the global opportunities uh, from these uh, pollutants? And uh, currently we are talking about uh, 4.0. And then uh, what is the conclusion and suggestion to move forward? Okay. So what does it mean by emerging pollutant concern? Because uh, now uh, we are when we say about water quality, we are discussing on the BOD, COD, biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, what else? TSS, uh, total solids, pH, pH, right? But uh, did you know that because nowadays we have uh, more illnesses, so that means uh, the clinical or hospital or medical line, they need to provide more medicines. Okay, we want to have our house uh, really super clean, so we need to add more chemicals in our cleaning agents. So this complex uh, substance added in our environment. So here it comes of the emerging pollutant of concern. No system. Okay. Uh, so it defined as an entry or, uh, into or being generated in the environment in appreciable amount uh, with the persistent that means it's very difficult uh, to remove by the conventional treatment system. So it having this effect on the organisms and it can occur from the pharmaceuticals and personal care products in water resource associated with uh, wastewater disposal. That means uh, in our house, Every day we clean, okay, we use the toothpaste, we use the face cleanser, right? And then uh, we do some, what we call that the pharmaceutical, we, when we sick, we got fever, so we take the medicines. So this uh, actually can add more complexity of the emerging pollutant of concern, okay? And in Malaysia, we don't have, uh, I mean, uh, put or added uh, this uh, uh, emerging policy concern yet in our regulation. And many of the countries also, they are not being regulated. So this always being overlooked. Okay. So what are the sources? As you can see from this figure, uh, it can be from the pharmaceutical, personal care products, and also fertilizer. If you uh, see from this uh, diagram, this is our water supply, okay? So they can come from many various of sources, as you can see here, from the pharmaceutical factories. The treated effluent might also uh, having this uh, substance of the pollutant concerns, right? In here, we have the agricultural activities, so the runoff and the fertilizers. The septic tank might be, it's not efficient, so the effluent may, might also uh, include or added in this water system. We also have this uh, drinking water treatment plant where we use a lot of alum for coagulant. So because of due to the high excess of the alum, it can be uh, lots of this uh, hydrofluoro, uh, what we call that, the, uh, what we, the excess of the alum in the water system. And then the wastewater, hospital nursing, uh, sometimes 
because of, we have uh, done uh, lots of these uh, treatment activities. Uh, so the effluent contains lots of the emerging pollutants. Okay, and of, of course from the residential residential areas. Okay, in Malaysia, these are our water quality index used by the Department of Environment for about twenty five years. Yeah, we have uh, six main parameters: uh, BOD. Okay, I think uh, because your your background is environmental engineering, uh, so you are familiar with these all parameters. So basically, this is the conventional method. Okay, to assess the water quality index. Okay, this is how we calculated uh, the water quality index. This is a uh, true traditional conventional method to measure our uh, the level of our water quality categories. Yeah. Because finally, we will calculate based on this category, the classes. So we calculate based on this uh, individual parameter, and then uh, we make the total of the water uh, water quality index. And then, uh, based on the calculation, we can see that the index is either in class one, class two is okay, three, three. We uh, now is getting slightly polluted. So we need to have the some extensive treatment need, needed required before uh, it can be supplied to the public, the water. Okay. Class four only allow for irrigation. Class five, no. It's like a sungai mati. Yeah. Tak boleh digunakan untuk ni, uh, for uh, water supply. Right. Okay. So this is the categories of the emerging pollutant that impacts on the soil, air, water, animals, plant, and microbiome. You can see, yeah, there are lots of these uh, sources, okay, they call as uh, emerging pollutants. Uh, it can go into the soil, water, and air, okay, so human can consume. Uh, and then also the animal plants and also the microorganism. So this is like uh, our change, yeah. So how we can going to break this emerging pollutant because it's already available in our environment. So the toxic effects of the typical EPs in the environment is, uh, as you can see from this table, okay, this is a study from this, uh, what we call it, researcher, occurrence and fate of major protein water environment option for the removal. So we have some engineered nanoparticles, right? This is uh, what we call it, having effects to the toxicology, toxic toxicity in this uh, in the plants and the fish earthworm okay and also the bacteria uh, so this can give effect to many of these our body system in terms of these lungs and very complex eh? endocrine okay ionic liquids and also the perfluorinated uh, compounds eh? You can see, okay, so it affect not only to the human, but also to the uh, organisms, the, to the uh, animals, yeah, wildlife, and so on. So always be overlooked. Yeah? That's why I'm bringing to all of you about the awareness on these emerging pollutants that become more concerned uh, nowadays. Yeah? Okay, this is the compounds. This one, we need to have a very high uh, advanced uh, 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 instrument okay to detect for example we need to have the gcms hplc and so on then we can detect uh, this uh, very uh, small detection of the compound and eh? it's not easy to uh, to detect uh, so we have this for example the trill chloropropane dioxin okay recently my phd student s3 uh, just uh, completed uh, her phd he studied uh, she studied on the trichlorocarbon from the gray water from the personal care products okay and uh, she used uh, hplc uh, to detect this uh, particular compound yeah okay and this is the effects on the human health so this is very what we call it something that needs to be done to control the occurrence of the emerging pollutants okay again the major consequences and adverse effects are the environmental concern of high concern on the human health and environment. Okay, as you can see, uh, we have now, as you know, uh, many of these uh, like uh, cancer illness is become more common, as you can notice, right? Cancer, yeah. So um, this is what we call it cancer carcinogenic. Uh, we also have these uh, issues on the what many people nowadays having uh, hypertension, right? 
Okay, this is uh, one factor because of the lifestyle, stress and so on. But uh, this is the some indirect factors which is come from this something that we cannot I mean, notice uh, from the drink, the water that we drink, for example, contains some of the emerging pollutants that can cause and also to activate uh, these illnesses. Yeah. Okay, what we can do? Uh, from this uh, review, uh, we need to have very advanced treatment, okay, to combat these emerging pollutants. Okay, first, uh, for the advanced treatment plan, we need to have this, for example, sonolysis, photocatalysis. Um, we, uh, two of my, my PhD students and also in my team, uh, they are looking for the, they, they are now working on the photocatalysis. Uh, that means, uh, for example, we use uh, zinc oxide, nanoparticles. Okay, and to uh, what we call that to remove and uh, degrade this uh, what, the pollutants. Okay, the emerging pollutants. Okay, but this is a lab, lab based study. So the zinc oxide can derive from many of these. Uh, can be synthesized from the green synthesis, for example, from the plants, right? And then uh, recently, my PhD student also uh, she used a uh, trip what we call that TO2 titanium dioxide, also one of the good uh, semiconductor to do use as a photocatalyst. So uh, we are now exploring what is the uh, good nano, nanoparticles that can be used okay, uh, to reduce uh, the effects of the emerging pollutants. We also can use this phantom-based oxidation and also the ozonation. Okay? Uh, so it depends if you having a, a high, I mean, funding, so you can go, for example, the membrane bioreactors. As we know, this is a very high, highly cost. Yeah, uh, but this is a uh, quite good in terms of uh, effective effectiveness. Okay, to uh, to biodegrade uh, this uh, chemical or uh, uh, emerging of concerns. Yeah. Okay, so this is the performance of the. If we put the membrane bioreactors, uh, it can remove the contaminants. Okay. Uh, then, then this is uh, some studies are done. Okay, and then this is a metal organic framework based on the nano absorber remediate because uh, this emerging politics is very, I mean, in a small quantities, yeah? uh, not part per billion, sometimes uh, part per trillion. Okay, so we need to have the very high extensive uh, uh, instrument okay, to, to go and detect, uh, to determine uh, these uh, pollutants. Okay, and so we need to have this uh, nano absorber in order to uh, what we call it to oxidize uh, these uh, pharmaceuticals and also the personal care product, especially in the wastewater treatment. Okay, this uh, for example, in Malaysia we have lots of these uh, cosmetics, yeah. Okay, uh, but we use because we uh, we want to be what we call it make appearance uh, pretty beautiful, right? But we don't know what was ingredient inside. And okay, that's why we need to really use, uh, make sure that it's a natural organic uh, substance. Okay. Okay, this is an example of the treatment and management of the CC. This is a chemical uh, con of emerging con contaminants. Okay. Okay, it's either they use the UV oxidants. Okay. But the issue is here is about the controlling factors, the dosage and UV that we use. Is about this range. Uh, we can also use the UV with ozone for the disinfect. Okay, the ozone can, uh, but we must consider about the ozone dose, uh, dosage, and also the pH and UV about this range. The photo phantom, okay, and then also the photocatalysis. Uh, usually, uh, we do the optimization by using, for example, uh, the software called uh, responsive based methodology uh, to, to know what is the best. Uh, optimum condition in order for us to say that, okay for by using this optimal condition we can achieve the high efficiency okay okay in terms of management we need to have this uh, detection uh, that and, and then uh, the issues is more on accuracy sensitivity and also the responsiveness so this is uh, this uh, illustrations of the reaction mechanism or the various like driven process because when we want to oxidize uh, this uh, pollutants, the target pollutant is not easy. Okay, we need to have this oxidant, ozone, maybe we need to combine the photopathenton, 
uh, and also the for the photo category this is the process okay we need uh, the light uh, natural light okay but it takes uh, a while I mean uh, it's good to have the UV but sometimes uh, we deal with the cost okay so there are many factors that we need to deal uh, when we want to make the decision what is the best uh, treatment okay uh, to reduce or to degrade this uh, emerging pollutants yeah Okay, this is the recent trends of the environment, uh, the emerging pollutants are study, okay, around the world. Okay, and then uh, this is from this uh, bibliometric analysis, right? Okay, we can see here when we search in this uh, Scopus and Web of Science uh, database uh, about uh, here the distribution of the environmental, uh, environment, emerging pollutant researchers in different countries in 2021. Okay, this is the uh, Asian. Uh, so this is uh, according to the different continents. Yeah. Okay, you can see the, the right here. US uh, having the high ranks of this uh, research on the EPs. Okay, in Asia, we are in Malaysia, we, we are ranked about uh, seven, number seven. Okay, uh, after uh, the other country. Yeah. Okay, this is around 400 documents yeah, that we search. Uh, by using this uh, bibliometric uh, analysis. We call it bibliometric analysis. It's like a mapping, yeah? And then this is the keyword used in the EP study in including antibiotic sewage and river monitoring, yeah? So you can see they have lots of research. You can uh, see, I mean, the distribution, okay? Many now currently the researchers are looking forward to see the antibiotic resistance study, yeah? Because of this, because of the uh, more, I mean, uh, they can see lots of these uh, negative effects uh, beside the conventional pollutants. Okay. okay, that's about the emerging pollutants. So let's see how does it, uh, I mean, uh, how is the current situation of the environment, especially in Malaysia, uh, that we are deal and also challenge eh, in our uh, environment. Okay, in 2000, 2019, we have a very big issue. It's very, very surprise eh? uh, because of the toxic waste dumping in 2019, uh, 19, uh, in March uh, 15. Okay, the dumping of toxic waste. Actually, it, have, it has been uh, about 10 years. I mean, the dumping activities illegally uh, uh, being, being implemented there. But I don't know what uh, authorities may be, or maybe this is a quite common practice. And suddenly, uh, they have uh, what kind of toxic arrives where uh, the school children that the school around this area, they, they are having these uh, symptoms. Okay, they have collapse, uh, they are faint, and then they vomiting. Okay, you can see if you want to uh, Google, uh, Kim Kim River toxic pollution, you can see the whole story. Okay, there are lots of the people affected, 6,000 people in this area, uh, in Johor Bahru. Yeah? Johor Bahru in this area is actually a very high profile of industrial activity. Okay, so this is uh, the bad consequences and also give us lots of lessons. Yeah? And then uh, many people hospitalized, right? And uh, if you can see here from the uh, Wikipedia, they, are look, uh, they have an exact value on how many people actually affected. So this is a very sad story to Malaysian, yeah? Kim Kim. Okay, another story, okay, this is common, okay, about the rapid urbanization and population growth, okay, uh, of course has contributed uh, to the water consumption. Uh, in several areas in Malaysia. And this is also concerns on the, in, in, this is in Penang, in conjunction with World Water Day. So it happens. I mean, we are still actually uh, having an issue with the uh, low awareness of the water quality, right? Uh, okay, this is in March in 2021. And actually today we have the water shortage in Selangor uh, water disruption uh, usually is either the water treatment plant being closed because of the high pollution, they cannot treat well, 
uh, maintenance yeah okay recently in on 4th of october we have a high uh, rainfall hujan lebat ya kalau di malaysia uh, so this is uh, the issue when they having this uh, flash flood uh, so they carry over all of these items okay in the river so you can see what's this refrigerator eh? kulkas ya and then sini ada tilam ya and lots of these uh, items uh, carry o- carry over during the flash flood so sad ya so it give uh, lots of this uh, more inclusion in the water system okay in global as you can see this is uh, something that deniable uh, about this uh, lack of the water quality and some quantity yeah, in some of the part of the world okay for example when i study in australia uh, in 2007 eh, because uh, in australia they don't have uh, much water right only 300 millimeter compared with malaysia so whatever uh, resources that they have uh, they, they i mean in terms of water it's very effective they, they will do the recycling, they reuse the grey water, the laundry, they use a very, what we call it, environmentally, uh, environmentally detergent, okay, so that the water can be reused for the garden irrigation, and then uh, the shower, they keep the water, okay, for the garden irrigation, it's something like that. So it's, it's very good uh, in terms of the water management, in terms of quantity because they don't have much water but but they have this uh, I mean a water good uh, planning strategies yeah okay so this is the water pollution in the developing world right uh, so because of this uh, well, the poor water quality uh, it becomes some um, outbreak so about 3.2 million children die each year because of the poor sanitation yeah you can see here I mean you know, the, the exactly the place this is from the world bank uh, so it, it, it is expected that in future our in, uh, in future maybe i'm be, become an old eh, old lady so you as a young generation uh, it can affect your earnings yeah by two percent this is uh, the study by the world bank so we need to be really careful maybe we have a very high salary but most of it we need to pay for the high good clean water for example we need to buy a high what we call that a uh, good quality of the filter water in our house right it's very expensive uh, we need to buy water so this affected our earnings yeah and this is uh, one of the sacred place in india ganga pollution but uh, they have a, uh, issues on the large quantity of the untreated water flowing to the rivers so in order to treat, they have lots of this uh, public money getting wasted. So we don't want to have this kind of the what we call the waste wastage, yeah, because the money can go for the something else to do the research, okay, to buy the instrument to detect the EPs, for example, and so on for education and so on, yeah. Okay, done with this. Uh, the effects of this, all of this, uh, what we call water pollution. So most of it, I believe that there are lots of the emerging uh, pollutants uh, in the water because of the pollution. Uh, so now we are moving forward to the circular economy. Okay, what does it mean by circular economy? So this is uh, something uh, that the researchers, okay, and also all these uh, leaders in the world are talking about. Yeah, okay, the current on trends now, because uh, we want to have this uh, harmonization. Okay. We want we are very ambitious because we want to make sure that the economic growth and also at the same time we want to maintain our environment. So this is our challenges. So for the students, especially on the environment engineering, you need to have a look on this aspect. Okay, what is it? We need to protect our environment, but at the same time, we can create the job opportunities. And then we can use our natural resources wisely. So the concept is we can take we need to make, we use, and dispose correctly. Yeah? So what does it mean here is, it's like the circular economy system is we can use uh, the production by using the renewable energy or by the other product, here the sources. 
uh, we have sources this uh, wastewater, domestic wastewater. We have uh, sludge from the wastewater, right? Uh, but we can do the recovery, okay? That can uh, give back to the society or for the to the government, for example. Yeah? Uh, that we can re recover to have this uh, potential energy. We can maintain the environment. So this is the concept. So we can back again to to have this production. Yeah. Okay. So that means it's no more after treated just dispose of into the river no that means we can uh, use again okay the water for to get for example the energy the biogas the waste can be convert into something beneficial like fertilizer i think everyone knows about it but sometimes uh, many of the treatment plant they don't apply because of the conventional system okay but they need to upgrade okay so that in future we we, have, we can get this uh, benefit from the waste yeah Okay, this is from the World Bank. I think it's very small here. Uh, that means here we have this uh, domestic uh, wastewater from the home, cities and industry. So become the treated, eh? we have the wastewater treatment plant. Okay, so it produced three waste. Treated water, sludge and phosphorus. The treated water can be used uh, okay, for this process and so on. Okay. Uh, the sludge can be, I mean, applied to the anaerobic digester to be, to produce the biogas and also the biosolids. In Malaysia, we have one plant in Kuala Lumpur, eh, a big plant uh, that they use the anaerobic digester to have this uh, biogas to supply and then they sell it to this uh, energy company. Okay, uh, but it's not, uh, I mean, the because of the high operational cost and so on, all these uh, certain plants that uh, the government or this uh, agency impose uh, this kind of treatment. Yeah? And then the biosolid can be used for fertilizer and then phosphorus can be recovered as a fertilizer. Yeah? This one. So this one can also can generate income, can uh, circulate the economy. Okay. So no more we say, okay, this is waste, we need to just uh, dispose of no, 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 the thinking is now what we can do uh, from this waste, we can generate the this money. Okay, this is an example in Malaysia. We have the scenario one and two. Uh, this is a CO treatment plan A, CO treatment plan B. Okay, for example, in uh, STPA, uh, they install the anaerobic digester for biogas production. Okay, the remaining waste, this, they produce the biofuel and sell to utilities. So this is the uh, life cycle cost analysis. Yeah? Uh, so this is internal rate of return. Uh, this is the ROI, return of investment. So payback period is about seven years. Okay, this is the scenario two uh, in, uh, in here, STPA. So they can get around this uh, NPV, net production value. Yeah? Okay, about this figure. And STPB, this is the scenario. Improve the efficiency rate of the biogas engine and anaerobic digester to put more biogas for generating electricity. And selling the remaining sludge production. So they can get the payback period more than 35 years, but they can get this NPV about this value, uh, 242 million, eh? uh, 622199. Okay. ROI about 13%. Okay, so I think. The this STPA uh, done a very I mean more efficient of the life cycle cost analysis eh? by installing the anaerobic digester and also the bio the sludge waste we used to produce the biofuel and sell to utilities. Okay, uh, I have um, just a few more slides and then I'm done. So future trends of the emerging pollutants, uh, they need to have this uh, more innovative technology that allow the real-time detection uh, and monitoring of a wide range of the pollutants in the environment. So we need to have some detection, okay? Uh, to control the pollution, we need to have the more effective water treatment system, no more conventional, just, I mean, uh, what we call that, uh, now the current uh, water treatment system is the uh, by using the coagulation, right? Put the alum, uh, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, right? And then I uh, put the uh, disinfectant like uh, the 
clothing and you can supply but we need to have more right we have more i mean uh, extensive uh, treatment in order for us to make sure that uh, our water quality also can remove or reduce the amount of the emerging pollutants okay of course the strict global global first policies and also the regulations and uh, the standard of the emerging policy in the global, uh, there's actually no specific uh, policy. Uh, but in the EU, they have the monitoring of the emerging policy as a conglomerate. In US, they have the issues on the guideline of the water quality to better conserve for the aquatic life in terms of the population pollution. And also they have the glo many of the global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance means we have the antibiotics. Okay, we use antibiotics, but the the bacteria cannot, I mean, biodegrade the, uh, this certain of this uh, uh, antibiotic because the antibiotic become resistant. Okay, uh, in the in the environment, yeah. Okay, in Malaysia, uh, the current status is we have this uh, transforming the water sector. Okay, the national six integrated water use of many plans for the environment they have included. Okay. Uh, okay, this is a very good news on the integrated water resource management measure. Okay, in, in the EQA, currently the uh, process of the public consultation and then uh, now uh, getting the approval eh, to include the emerging pollutants in Malaysia. Okay, now issue is uh, adding more complexity because of the pandemic. Okay, the virus uh, COVID-19, we have uh, more medication. We have uh, more drugs okay, in our water system. Uh, so it becomes uh, more concern here uh, to inactivate yeah, this, especially in the wastewater. Okay, this is a uh, very, I think, uh, our move forward on how the researchers, okay, the scientists, and also the engineer on how we can uh, minimize uh, this risk. Yeah. Okay, uh, for the role of the uh, IR 4.0, because now we are talking about the smart sensors, okay, cyber physical system. So this is uh, something that the students need to look okay, in, for the future on how uh, you can embed the system, the smart sensors, uh, cyber physical and so on in, in order uh, to maintain our environment. Right? So you must have this uh, capacity and the up-to-date knowledge okay, on how we can evaluate the real time Okay, just uh, by using the, your mobile phone, so you can see the detection, how much is your, uh, how much is the BOD, maybe BOD in the, in the water system, okay, at least. And then uh, if you can go to the emerging pollutant, that will be very super great, yeah? Okay, cyber physical system and so on, augmentation reality, like a game, yeah? Okay, as a suggestion, uh, is, uh, we can establish, for example, to as a uh, for the training center uh, to give a uh, more awareness uh, to the community, okay, uh, to all about these uh, emerging pollutants, increase the building capacity, okay, the governments uh, collaborate with the universities, universitas, right, and then uh, with the community and also the school children about the antibiotics, uh, their role in the water, Right, and then uh, what we have uh, in the water system, not only the basic water quality parameter, but there are more, right? And and also it's so eco-friendly services and green technology about the circular economy. And most importantly is uh, education. We need to have more research on these emerging pollutants. Okay. Okay, so this is my conclusion. Awareness is very important. The technology, okay, in order to support the technology, we must have this uh, good funding, okay, uh, from the international body, from the government itself, okay, we need to have uh, the good understanding on this emerging pollutants and also the monitoring guideline, yeah, guideline is very important. Okay, this is uh, my team studies on the emerging pollutants in this year. Okay, we have published in a few journals in a uh, high impact factor. Okay, this. This is uh, the study from the Zinabati of the compounds in grey water by using the zinc oxide nanoparticles uh, from my students. And this is my colleague, Dr. Adele, a very uh, good, uh, good scientist. Okay? Uh, and this is uh, uh, 
uh, what we call a study on the cyclexin antibiotics uh, from the non-clinical environment we just published in the hazardous waste materials uh, impact factor Q1 yeah? I think 10, 10 something and this is the removal okay, of the cyclexin by using the copper zinc by nanocomposite composite, right uh, there are many, I mean, in my team, we have uh, exploring uh, many of these uh, biocomposite nanoparticles, okay, in order to, uh, bio, I mean, to remove, okay, to see how it reacts with the certain uh, the emerging pollutants. Okay, this is also the recent publication from my PhD student about this. Uh, she used a modified titanium dioxide nanotubes zeolite composite photocatalyst. Uh, to degrade the trichrocarbon uh, from the bath, bathroom grey water from the personal care products. Yeah? And actually, a few more because of the space. So you can uh, check uh, my profile and so on. Yeah? Okay, this is also collaboration with, with uh, the book Norina Fitriani yeah? okay? uh, from UNEL, your lecturer, right? Okay, uh, with that, uh, I end my presentation. Uh, this is uh, my research center. Besides of doing this uh, lab, laboratory scientific research and so on, we also conducting uh, water quality sampling. This is uh, just recently we have uh, what we call samples on the water quality from the semiconductor industry to be tested. Okay, several talks eh? and also the software and this is the community activities. So, uh, I think that's all. Uh, the book Norina, I think last two years, uh, already a few years, a few few, few times, uh, she and also some of the few students having the outbound activities yeah, in UTHM. Uh, hopefully for next uh, future after the uh, borders are okay and you're allowed to travel, uh, please come to UTHM. We can do, you can show around our university uh, activities and how we can, uh, what we could do more on the research collaboration. Okay, so this is my uh, email address. This is the Facebook for the MPRC and my contact address. I think that's all, uh, Mr. Pawahid. Okay, thank you, Umaya, for the very good speaking I'm from the first until the end. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, for yes. Maya. She has told you for a really good speech from emerging pollutants. Yeah. So CECS, uh, and she told anything on how to treat the CECS and EPS, and also how to yeah. deliver the waste to energy, and also how the future uh, trends of EPS and also the her research. I think all of them are related and really, really delivered in good sequences. Thank what you. I really note in, in, in her speech is uh, EPS, ECS, everything else is need to be treated and it is better if we move it to circular economy and treat it to be something useful like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have already one question from Maya in, in the chat. Uh, I will I will love it. I will read the questions. It's from Bagas Pramudia. Uh, he is one of our students in Erlanga University. Mm -hmm. He asked uh, about um, the wetlands. Oh, okay. Wetlands are known for years as natural bioreactors. What yeah. I want to ask is due to the way that most rivers flow from the upstream to estuary, yeah. do wetlands have the potential in treating EPS? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Yang Bertanya. Okay, and also Pak Wahid, yeah. So wetland is a natural process, eh? natural purification uh, secara alami eh? uh, for the treatment of this uh, polluted water. Um, it very good in removing the heavy metals. So heavy metals can be part of the emerging pollutant as well. So I, I assume that it can potentially also to remove uh, certain, uh, yeah. because we have the organic and inorganic, right? heavy metals can be organic. Uh, maybe yes, uh, because I never look into it. Uh, to to heavy metal is good for EPs. Um, we can suggest for the I mean more accurate uh, what we call testing, right? For the future research. Um, yes, I hope that I can answer you. Thank you. I think it's enough. Uh, for the because uh you mentioned about the metal removal and everything, I think that's the potential of the having the wetlands. Yes. Okay. 
Next question is maybe from me, for myself. Uh, during your talk, uh, I have wondering a lot of things. Maybe I will ask one or two questions. The first question is, you talk about uh, the photocatalyst, uh, what is it, mm, treatment in treating the CACS or EPS. Um, last, 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 what is, last years, I read some papers about photocatalyst and maybe I don't really, really get into it. What I really wonder about it is, does it have the waste weights or maybe the byproduct from the photocatalyst maybe after the treatment the yeah. it becomes some more dangerous things or something like that okay thank you very much that the first questions very good question yeah uh actually uh from my students uh study okay uh one is uh, they she use uh zinc nanoparticles uh, and also uh another one is the modified zinc uh titanium dioxide okay Uh, for the zinc oxide, uh, we can do this uh, degradation uh, for certain, it's very good, uh, very effective uh, to remove the dye. Uh, and then uh, she studied on the reusability. It can be actually uh, be reused, uh, I mean, two or three times. Yeah? Uh, so I don't remember actually the period of time, but it can... Uh, the, the study show it can be reused again. That means uh, it's uh, not like a byproduct, but we can reuse again uh, before we say, okay, this is the lifetime of the photocatalyst. Then we can dispose of something like that. So it can be recycled. So how many times we can recycle it? Actually? Uh, we can uh, at least two times. Can. Okay, okay, okay. So the photocatalyst using UV, right, or using another another source of source of light? Natural source. My, my Natural student. source. Oh, yeah. it's sun. It's sun, sun, sunlight. <laughs> okay, that is a better better idea. Not using a UV because uh, what I read in last year is using UV and it's not the sun sunlight. So I think it's more better, right? It's better. <laughs> okay. The second uh, question. The UV um, is expensive, but it's uh, it's very expensive. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Because uh, last 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 paper I, I read is my professor paper is using UV to remove uh, some contaminant like uh, nicotine and anything else like that in in the water body. So I think it's real bit expensive and unapplicable. But if using sun as the as the what is it source of the energy, I think it's good idea or maybe better idea. <laughs> okay, the second questions um, we talk about the circular economy, right? Uh, there is also you mentioned about the biofuel in 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 your speech in Indonesia oh, bio, biofuel sorry you get it right biofuel we move we we trans we convert from the wastewater from a bio bio gas to the maybe oh, to the yes. yeah and then the, also biofuel biofuel yeah. yeah biofuel sorry if my speaking not really clear <laughs> you okay biofuel uh. In Indonesia, biofuel is not really used. We have one product, the producer or one industry creating biofuel. But the problem is the market. The market doesn't really open to the biofuel in Indonesia. So um, the treatment itself does, doesn't really meet the, the what is it? The economic economic value. So they produce it so many, but in the end, there, there is no one buy it. So how about in Malaysia, the, the biofuel? Uh also same I, uh, i can say that because it's not really uh, quite common yeah uh, the information is not really needed just for research yes uh, but for biofuel um, but i think uh, some of the institution or agency still uh, finding a way on how they can convince uh, the i mean the industry player right? because mm -hmm. many ticket so it can be uh, more on this uh, Uh, commercialization so that public can convince us uh, to use the biofuel okay. but still on i can say that. yes in the end we we always know that the problem is not about the technical but also the social and the politic anything else is related to it we have the technology but the politic and social not related i think it's not ready yet <laughs> it will be just uh yeah the technology and not 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 be used okay Uh, I think it's enough, Prof. Maya, uh, about our, our first, first session. Um, maybe the committee will give you some certificate after this. So before that, I would like to 
uh, ask you about the closing statement for all of us. The strong message from from your speech, maybe oh. one or two words. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, so this is a uh, very important yeah for us uh, to I mean whatever uh, aims or target that we want to do in future, please uh, we put into consideration our environment because it's our life. As you can see, yeah, behind is uh, our faculty. We have lots of this on farm. We have lots of this uh, tree that we need to maintain. So this is our part of our responsibility. So please uh, spread the awareness about this uh, EPs, uh, all these uh, pollutants, okay, so that everyone can know about it. Because if we if not, it will come back to us. Okay. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof Maya. Maybe the committee, uh, maybe the certificate, you can deliver. Oh, yes, <laughs> by online. Maybe if offline, we can give you the uh, directly. But this is a online meeting, so we just show the the document. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is certificate for you. <laughs> <laughs> if we will send you by mail or maybe by another media, you know, sure. Maybe how the committee will contact you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Mayo, for the speaking. Maybe before last, 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 before we continue to the next session, we can take a photograph together. Maybe the committee will lead the session. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we will in charge in in this session, the committee. Okay. Can you hear my Yeah, voice? yeah, we can hear okay. clearly. Yes. Okay, so everyone, please get ready and let me to document this activity. So, please on cam. So please, for other participants uh, who may be possible and eligible, please turn on your camera to take a picture together. Maybe not all is okay. The committee. Okay, come on guys, on camera, just one slide. Finish. Okay, so okay. let me take a picture okay. in one, two, three. Okay, next slide. One, two, three.
Recording in progress. In Asian fruit parasitism. Since 2014, he is a professor in the Department of Environmental Science, and he also served as a vice president for International Exchange and also um, deputy for director of International Exchange Center at Nara Women's University in Japan. So he already received uh, numerous grants, especially from GSPS, and he got the honor for uh, to be the visiting researchers and also got the award in 2007. That is uh, the Akira Okubo Award, Akira Okubo Prize, and then Ecological uh, Research Award. And also for uh, his professional services, he is editorial board of population ecology and being also the associate editor for uh, some journals. He is now also the steering committee member of the Japanese Society for uh, Mathematical Biology. So Professor Takasugo already published uh, so many publications, but I would like to highlight his recent one. So in 2020, last year, he already published a paper and applied mathematical modeling entitled Asymptotic Behaviors of Stochastic Epidemic Models with Germ Diffusion. So I think uh, Professor Fugo already joining us today. And I believe that uh, he will deliver a very interesting uh, lecture for us. So uh, without any further ado to Professor Takasu, we will have 45 minutes for the presentation and we're going to have Q&A at the end of the lecture. Yeah, Takasu-sensei, do you recognize us? Time is yours. Yes. So thank you very much for a kind introduction, Dio. And first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Fatmati and Dr. Nulina of the Faculty of Science. Ireland University. So I am now joining this webinar from Nara City, Japan. So Nara is quite a small city, but uh, yeah, I send you some information about Nara on chat. Yeah, because Nara is a quite small city, but in the eighth century, it's more than 1,000 years ago, Japan capital was in Nara. So still, our city has a lot of some cultural property, mostly Buddhism cultural properties. So from my office, I see some temples yeah, nearby. So I'm Johnny. I'm very happy to have a chance to give a talk about my recent research. So I belong to Nara Women's University. It is a national women's university. So all students are girls. So I'm doing research with my students. And today, I'd like to introduce or maybe talk about my recent topics. So I am a mathematical biologist. So I study biology, especially ecology. But I use mathematical and computational approaches. So it's a kind of applied mathematics and some computer scientists. So today, I'm going to talk about mathematical modeling of metapopulations. So later in my slide, I introduce what metapopulation is. It's quite a simple concept in ecology. But I will mention that my research could be applied to many fields, especially the same approach could be applied to modeling of infectious disease. Now the world is suffering from COVID-19. Yeah. So metapopulation analysis is quite similar to mathematical modeling of epidemi epidemiology. So my talk is a little bit mathematical one, but I try to explain in the plain mathematics. So I switch my, I share with my slides, so just a moment. Oh. Okay, then, okay, just a moment. I prepare, okay, just a moment. Mm. Okay, 
So now, can you see my slide? Yes, Professor. Oh, okay. Now, my talk today is about the spatial metapopulation dynamics as a point pattern dynamics. So essentially, it is quite mathematical, but I'd like to introduce what metapopulation is. So metapopulation is a special term used in ecology, but it's simply a collection of populations. So a metapopulation is a collection of populations. So in this case, we think about many local sites or local patch in which some biological species can live. So we usually focus on presence or absence of a biological species in the patch. Then we assume that the biological species can locally go extinct. Then the patch becomes empty or vacant. And a vacant patch can be colonized by, by the dispersed species from another occupied site. So maybe the next slide it better explain what metapopulation is. So this is a figure taken from the one paper. And, and yes, maybe let, let's focus on this graph here. Maybe I just draw just a moment. This is the zoom. Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe, yeah, we think about that collection of local site, which is now called patch. So each patch is a small population, or maybe it's easier to imagine a collection of some islands. Maybe there are many islands. So it, we have many islands in Japan, so maybe on also Indonesia. So in each island, we focus on presence or absence of a barrica species, many animal or insect, whatever. Then this is a metapopulation that is made of many local sites or local patches. Then the biological species can go extinct. So this is unoccupied site. It is empty site. But this empty site can be occupied by colonizations, especially for some birds or some insects that can fly, they can move from an occupied site to another unoccupied empty site. Then they are colonized. Then we focus on the process of local extinction. Local extinction means that just by chance, the species can locally go extinct or maybe they go extinct by human activity. So in the metapopulation dynamics, we focus on local extinction and colonization process. Then the problem is how metapopulation dynamics change with time. So this is a one um, long lasting question in ecology. Okay, so now I move to the next slide. Okay. Then, because I am a mathematical biologist, we want to understand from a mathematical viewpoint. So we have a classical model that is called the Levin's model. That is quite old. And this model focus on the proportion or fraction P of your occupied site. So there are many local sites and we want to understand how the proportion of occupied site increase or decrease with time. Then capital P is a proportion. And Levins, he proposed just simple mathematical models. So that is an ordinary differential equations. 
ODE. So the left hand side is the time derivatives of fraction P. It is given by colonization to the empty patch and local extinctions. So this is a simple ODE about the fraction P of occupied site. And it is it has two parameter values, colonization rate and local extinction rate. So we can easily analyze this ODE models to have the equilibrium fraction P of occupied site. That is given by these equations. So it depend it depends on colonization rate C and the local extinction rate E. If E is less than C, the fraction P eventually converts to this value that is less than one, but greater than one, greater than zero. But if extinction rate E is larger than the colonization rate C, then P is zero. This means that the all patches are empty. Yeah, this is a result based on the simple ODE models, but I would stress that this is non-spatial models. Non-spatial means that we only focus on the proportion of occupied site. So we don't care about the spatial location or spatial distribution of occupied site. But in real world, almost all biological populations are distributed over space, mostly on two-dimensional space. So we want to understand how spatial metapopulation distribution will be. So this is my motivation. And in the next slide, I introduce how non-spatial models can be extended to be spatial models. So historically, many mathematical biologists try to extend non-spatial models to spatial models as a lattice space. So yeah, lattice space is a kind of discrete space, and it is easy to imagine. It is shown in, so this is an example of lattice. It's like a checkerboard on the chess. And each site, if we focus on each site, status of each site is zero. This means an empty, vacant, or, a local site can be occupied. That is shown by plus. Then we assume that the occupied site can change to status zero vacant by local extinction. But empty site, vacant site can become occupied by colonization from the neighboring occupied site. So maybe it's intuitively natural because colonization comes from the neighbors, neighbored occupied site to and vacant. Then this model is called lattice metapopulation models. So the rule is very simple. Yeah. So this is the rule. A vacant site zero is colonized from adjacent occupied site and it becomes occupied site. And an occupied site plus becomes vacant by local extinction. Yes. Then in the next slide, I show some simulation of lattice metapopulation models. Yes. Yeah, but before that, I mentioned that colonization and local extinction goes parallel with infection and recovery in epidemiology. 
now we are suffering from COVID-19 all the world. And still, yeah, more and more people get vaccinated. So I hope in near future, COVID-19 will be well controlled in the worldwide. Yes. But in the metapopulation models, colonization yeah, is infections. Because here, okay, here we have some susceptible people or maybe susceptible city. So it is a COVID-19 free city. And plus means it is occupied, occupied by some infectious disease. It corresponds to infectious. So you can imagine that some disease-free city can become infectious by people's movement from infectious status. So actually, my talk about the metapopulation models is exactly the same as the epidemiological dynamics, infection and recovery. So, so you might listen to my talk in terms of epidemics, but my talk is about the metapopulation in ecology. Yes, and in the next slide, I show some simulation result of lattice models. Okay, I skip. So this is a so-called SIS models in epidemiology. So maybe in COVID-19, you might heard of some SIR models. Now many people use SIR models to predict the COVID-19 infection, but this will be another topic. So I just skip this slide. And then the next slide. So this shows a simulation. Here we assume a lattice space, 40 by 40 lattice. And red side represent it is occupied. So some, there is some, some population inhabit there, and the blue site is vacant site. In epidemiology, red site correspond to infectious site, and the blue site correspond to susceptible. Then we run the simulation. Then starting from a small number of occupied site, it expand over the space, and on the top right graph, plot the number of occupied site and vacant site. So starting from condition, okay, so I show the simulation again. Eventually, the spatial metapopulation reaches some equilibrium in which the number of occupied and vacant site is nearly some equilibrium. So this is the simulations. And if we have some knowledge about computer programming, yeah, we can easily learn these simulations. It is a kind of computer science. But as a mathematical biologist, we want to understand this process using mathematics. And yeah, this is a little bit beyond the scope of the, my talk, but I briefly introduce how we mathematically analyze lattice models. So in these models, we focus on the probability that row zero and row plus. So this is a probability that a randomly chosen site is status zero or plus because it is a probability. They have to sum up to one. So we call this a singlet probability because we focus on one cell or one site. And in the next, we focus on adjacent to two local sites, two cell. Then we introduce the pair or doublet probability that the probability of adjacent to cell is in 
Sigma and Sigma dash. So this is a double density or double probability. So this is a key concept to analyze lattice models using mathematics. Yes, so I just skip it, this one. It's quite mathematics. And then we derive some dynamics, ODE, about the singlet probability and maybe doublet probability. And using some approximation, you can, we can calculate the average probability of occupied site, like this. Yes. But it is quite mathematics, So, but I just skip it. So this is just introduction. So I have introduced lattice models. So space is lattice. But uh, all of you would agree that the lattice space is too artificial. It's like a checkerboard on chess. So maybe we should consider more realistic approach to represent spatial distribution of each patch. Then this is point pattern. The point pattern is quite flexible representation of location of each site. So in the lattice space, X and Y coordinate of each site is just integer values, integer 0, 1, 2. It was quite regular, but in a Point pattern, x and y coordinate is a continuous variable, and location can be represented by some real values, not integers. So it's just so. This is a point pattern. Then we focus on how status of each point changes between zero vacant and occupied plus and back to zero by local extinctions. So point pattern or mapped point pattern in spatial statistics, it is a quite flexible way to represent any spatial distribution of local site. So my research interests start from classical lattice models. Lattice is very simple, but the lattice space is too artificial to be realistic. Then my research starts to extend lattice models to point pattern models. Yeah. Okay. Then I explain about our point pattern models. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But before that, here is an example of point patterns. Yeah, I took this figure from some paper from Forestry. I guess some participant here might study forest, forest trees. It is important in ecology. But if you go to the mountains, now we can use GIS or GPS thanks to IT technology, then we can locate the location of each trees in the some trees in the forest. Then this is an example of point patterns. Here, location of live trees are shown in closed dot. Yeah, it is a live live tree. Here, it is live trees. But open circle represents location of dead trees. It is dead dead by some tree disease or some other reasons. Then this is an example of point patterns. So basically, XY coordinate is not restricted to, restricted to integers. It can be real values. So if we focus on some animal or bird who live in such a trees, maybe it could be some point pattern dynamics. Then my motivation was how we can extend lattice model to point pattern models. Okay. Then 
we want to extend lattice model to point pattern models. But to, if we focus on point pattern, we have some difficulty because in lattice space, it was easy to define who is neighbors because space is checkerboard. Definition of neighbors is quite straightforward. But for point patterns, neighbors are not self-evident. Then we assume some distance-dependent local interaction in ecology. Yeah. In ecology, colonization is one process. Or in ecology, competition for common resources is another interaction. Or maybe yeah. Predator and predation. Predation is another interaction. In ecology, most interactions are distance dependent. So it depends on distance between some two agents or some two populations. Then we introduce distance dependent colonizations. Because for colonization, some animal or insects, they have to fly from this point to another point and the colonization rate will likely be distance dependent. It depends on distance. If the distance is far away, colonization rate would be small. But if distance is short, colonization would be high. So we assume distance dependent colonization and we build our models. But before I introduce our models, I briefly introduce how to quantify a point pattern. A point pattern is simply a collection of points. Then the simplest measure is simply the number of points in the point patterns. We just count how many points are included in the point patterns. But uh, in the next slide, I show that the number of point, but the point pattern in the right, it has the same number of point, 1,000. But you see that these two patterns are quite different, very different. Then to tell the difference between the two point patterns, we need to focus on pairs. So we focus on pairs, all pairs, and focus on distribution of pair distances. This is often called the second order structure of point patterns. So first order structure as the number of points. It is not enough because it just focus on the total number of points. But to focus on spatial distribution, we need to focus on the second order structure as pair as pairs. Okay, now I yeah speed up because I have not yet started my main point. Then pair correlation function describes the second order structure. So it is often used in the spatial statistics. So I just skipped here. Okay, well, still somebody is doing nasty things. So this is our assumption, the distance dependent colonization rate. So here we have several local patches and blue is empty site and red is an occupied site. And we assume distant dependent colonization from occupied site shown in red. And we assume a certain function that is a function of distance D that is shown in function C. Function C can be any function, but here we assume some Gaussian type. Yeah, this is our assumptions. Then I show some simulation results. Yeah, in this movie, 
I show some example of simulation. Yes. So red is occupied site and blue is vacant site. She occupied sites spread to the space and eventually the number of occupied sites and vacant sites reaches some equilibrium. Okay, this is just simulations. But in another cases, this is another simulation. So in this case, occupied sites do not expand because I have reduced the total number of points by half. So in this case, colonization does not expand to the, all the space. And this is another simulation. So in this case, yeah, yeah, occupied site do not spread anymore. Yes, then yeah, this summarizes how the number of occupied and vacant sites first of the structure and change with time. Yes, yeah, but I just omit it because I have about 10 minutes left. So this is the simulation result. So the left graph shows that when colonization range, parameter sigma C control how far colonization can occur. If the colonization rate is small, this is a equilibrium state. But if we increase the colonization rate twice large, okay, to the old space. So of course, the sigma C as a colonization range, it is a one critical parameter values to determine the equilibrium spatial distribution of occupied and vacant site. Yes. So up to now, this is only simulations. And next, yeah, we want to do some mathematics, but I just skip it. Yeah. So the basic idea is that we first focus on one point. This is called first order structures. So we focus on how many points are in status vacant or occupied. But the next, we focus on the second order structure. Here we have one pair made of two points. So in this case, one status of a point is zero vacant or plus. Then another status is zero or plus. So there are four combinations of pairs. Zero, zero pair, plus, plus pair, or zero plus pair, or plus zero pairs. Then we might further focus on the third order. In this case, we have to think about some triplet made of three points. So this is how we mathematically analyze point pattern dynamics. We first start from the first order dynamics mathematically, and the next we focus on the second order. And lastly, maybe we might need to focus on third order. Okay, I speed up. Mm. And what we do is that we focus on Sorry, Professor, I think uh, your microphone is mute. Um, okay, so, so, I'm sorry, I have muted yes, my okay. microphone again. Okay, okay so, so I, go, I go back to my talk, so. So we focus on mm, the probability that a single point is in status plus, plus, or a zero or a plus. 
then we focus on pair probability that the pair ij is in status 0, 0, or 0 plus, or plus 0, or plus plus. Then we derive the dynamics of the singlet probability and pair probability, but I just skip it. Yes. So this is a transition diagram to derive the dynamics. And this is a singlet dynamics. It describes the dynamics of the singlet, and we have pair probability inside. Then we derive, oh, we derive pair dynamics yeah, here. We focus on the dynamics of pair probability and we have some triplet probability involved. But actually, we don't know how the triplet probability is then we need to approximate. Here we introduce some approximation. It is called moment closure. <laughs> using the pair probability and singlet like this. Then we are ready to analyze the mathematical models of the point pattern dynamics. Yes. Yeah, I think I should finish my talk in a few minutes, but I just skip it. Then from the dynamics, we can derive the equilibrium of the pair probability. So th that is our main new findings. So we can analytically derive equilibrium pair probability. That can be very important for later discussions. And inside the pair probability, here we have colonization rate as a function of distance between pairs. Actually, in the simulation, we assume Xiang or exponential or any function in the simulations. But we can mathematically calculate equilibrium pair probability as a function of colonization rate. Yes. Then, yeah, anyway, I skip it. Then, then we can do a lot of some analysis, but uh, this is our main finding from the mathematical modeling of spatial metapopulation models. Yeah. So we found that the equilibrium can be analytically derived. And this result can be applied to some any point pattern dynamics in which local colonization and uh, local colonization rate and local extinction is given. Yes. And now we enter the discussion part. So my model is quite conceptual and uh, conceptual modeling, and that cannot be directly applied to real biology. But now using the IT technology or satellite image analysis, location of local site is getting easily obtained. And we have more and more real data about absence or presence of biological species in each local site. So this figure plots some conceptual idea about this is some observations. So here, there are many local sites and some, some site is just empty. So there is no biological species living in the state. But in some sites, this site is occupied some species live in such site. So from this real point pattern data, we can estimate the function of colonization rate D because estimation of colonization rate is quite difficult 
because we have to track movement of animal or insect, how far they fly over. But it's quite difficult. But from the real data of point pattern, we might be able to estimate the functional form of colonization rate as a function of distance. Yes. Yes. And in my talk, we just focus on the empty or occupied. There are two status, but it can be extended to some another models like SIR models in epidemiology. So maybe we might introduce some permanent destruction by human activity. This corresponds to SIR models. So in the next slide, I show some simulation results. Yeah. So here in this simulation, black dot is a local site that is permanently destroyed by human activity. Yes, and in this simulation, we control the, yeah, here the black, so this is a number of permanent destroyed patches. Maybe human activity, destroyed patch might increase, but uh, due to the conservation activity, we might reduce the number of destroyed patch. It is a renewal process activity. Then there are three status, empty patch and occupied patch and permanent destroyed. So permanent destroyed correspond to the lifetime immunity epidemiology. Because some disease, some infectious disease, like some smallpox gives lifetime immunity. Once I get the disease and recovered, I get a lifetime immunity and I will never be infected again. So this is a lifetime immunity that corresponds to the permanent destroyed status. So actually, my studies about the metapopulation can be further extended as a SIR models in epidemiology to consider about the permanent destroyed status by the human activity. Yeah. And lastly, so this is the last slide. This is just a dis uh, discussion. And I am now applying the point pattern approach to some three disease. It is called pine wheel to disease or pine. I'm sorry, pine wheel to disease. It is a serious threat, threat to pine trees in East Asia, Japan, China, Korea. And also it has expanded to some Europe by trading. I'm not sure if you have pine wheel disease in Indonesia. Indonesia is subtropical. Maybe you don't have PWD. But we know that the pine wheel disease is caused by the nematodes. It's a quite tiny nematode. That is vectored by beetles. The beetle flies away, and beetle dispersal is a key to determine how pan wheel to disease spread over space. And tree, it does not move. It can be represented by a point. So pine, spatial distribution of pine wheel to disease can be easily modeled using point pattern process. And this is what I'm doing with my student. And also, colonization and local extension goes parallel with infection and recovery in epidemiology. And today, I have extended so-called SIS models. Susceptible become infectious and infectious becomes back to susceptible. It is good for some normal flu or SIR models with permanent immunity or immunity might be lost. It, this is SIRS models. And if we consider some latent period, we introduce another state exposed 
So there are many mathematical models in etymology, but it is made by ODE. But these are non-spatial. They ignore spatial distribution. But these models can be easily extended as point pattern approach to explicitly consider spatial distribution of locations. So I think this point pattern approach is quite promising. And I'm now doing this research with my students. So yeah, I finished my talks. So as a mathematical biologist, I work on very conceptual models. It's quite mathematical mathematics. But I believe this mathematical modeling can be applied to real biological problem for metapopulation models. I think this could be useful to the conservation biology, how we can manage to save some extinction process or endangered species or animals in futures. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to give a talk on my talks. So I finished my talk. So if you have any question, any question is welcome. So I finished my talk and switch to San Dio, my coordinator. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. It's a very interesting uh, lecture. And also we are truly sorry for your inconvenience during the lecture. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe I would like to summarize uh, what uh, Professor Takasufuku already talked. So he already introduced us about the how we can Recording in progress. Uh, Osaka is quite have the good data, uh, realistic data about how people move between cities. Maybe this can be used to use in our point pattern models. So it could be very some practical research, but uh, I have no such data. Mm. Okay, thank you, Professor. So uh, in the comment section, we have uh, yeah. some questions. I think it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I would like to read it. So the first is from yeah. Afisa, is a student from Ireland University. Uh, she asked about 
how does the distribution pattern of certain species affect the calculation of metapopulation dynamics? Yes, I, I, I think it, I, I think it, it's possible. So metapopulation is a population of population. It's a collection mm -hmm. of many populations. And I think basically, yes. So instead of local extinction, maybe, yeah, we, you know, in case of some biodiversity, maybe we focus on some biodiversity index. If the index is zero, nobody is there. But if index is one, only one species are present. If the index is two, two species coexist. So maybe by giving some more index to each site, I think, yeah, your biodiversity in terms of spatial diversity can be analyzed using point patterns. But okay. I think this can be well applied to some species that live in patchy environment. Yeah. Okay, uh, so for uh, the next question, it is from uh, Gia Aldina. She is also a student of Erlanga University. Uh, she, she wants to ask, instead of extinction by epidemic or disease, can we use metapopulation to predict the number of extinction by diversity population caused by toxic waste? So, for example, to predict the number of extinction coral population affected by the wastewater from nearby water plants. Yes, so coral, yeah, yeah, coral reefs. So, yeah, I'm not familiar with coral ecology, but I guess if the coral is locally distributed, maybe, yeah, I think we, we can think about, uh, yeah, extinction is coral metapopulation, yes. And locally, some pop, some some fishes can go extinct by locally by some wastewater something like this, but the empty patch can be colonized from another coral by mm. some movement. So I think yeah, I think yeah, it, it's possible. Mm. I think so. Mm. Okay, thank you, Professor. So uh, we still have time. Maybe if you have uh, another question. You can also ask to directly to Professor Takasu. Okay, we have another question, Professor. It is uh, from Chong. So I want to ask, can it extend the model of continuous, for example, perhaps, can the model predict the degree of pop, uh, uh, pollution? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, so in, yeah, inherently, meta, uh, point pattern assumes some discrete entity. So one point represents one, one unit, individual or city or one local population. So if we model some continuous space, mm -hmm. maybe we would use another approach. So we often use some partial differential equations. We call this reaction diffusion models in mathematical biology. So maybe in this case, point pattern approach would not be good. We would use some reaction diffusion models mm -hmm. as partial differential equations. Yeah, river. Yeah, river is continuous from the up upstream to the downstream. It's a continuous entities. But even in continuous entity, if we if you can assume some local area, like some, for example, I'm not sure, is some local entity and characterized by some water depths or summer chains, then point pattern approach would be good. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, I hope it can answer uh, the questions. Okay, uh, we still have time. Maybe you have another questions. You can directly ask, or you can write down in the comment section. So uh, maybe, Professor, I have uh, another questions, but is it, maybe it's not related to your talk. Uh, once uh, you say that, uh, I mean, uh, when I read your CV, you are uh, currently the vice president for uh, exchange yes. center. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe we have uh, many participants, which is uh, the university student, and mm -hmm. maybe you can uh, explain to us, maybe there is another yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, program about the exchange, thank you. Yes, 
Yeah, actually, yeah, I gave talk as one scientist, but now I am in charge of vice president of my university, responsible for international exchange. And actually, yeah, I am planning to make partnership with the Faculty of Science and Technology, University of Ilanga. That is why I made contact with Dr. Fatmati and, uh, yeah. And I hope in the near future, we can make some, we can conclude official partnership to launch international collaboration in research and some education. So my university is quite small, and now it's difficult to invite foreigners because of COVID-19, but we want to try to communicate, maybe launch another webinar to socialize between my university student and Ireland university student. So basically, a Japanese student are very shy. They are quite shy, and also their English is not so good. Uh, I'm certain probably your, your student would be much better in English. So I hope to launch some opportunities in which our student and your student communicate in English. And after COVID-19 is very controlled, I welcome your staff and students to come to join some short program in my university. And I also want to send our students to Ilanga to join some international activity. So as vice president in charge of international activity, I hope to promote the academic collaboration between Ilanga and my university. Yeah, this is my just uh, last word. Okay, thank you, Professor. We are uh, looking forward for the program. <laughs> I think uh, many of our students here are very interesting with the uh, Japanese university, especially mm -hmm. about the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting if uh, they can also have the exchange program mm -hmm. and uh, maybe have like one semester in Japan that would be yeah. interesting mm -hmm. for them, yeah. So I think we don't have another questions for uh, this, quick, this session and we can finish the Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, maybe you have another closing statement before we end the session, please. Okay, thank you very much for joining my talk. So I wanted to stress the importance of mathematics and skill in computer programming that can be very useful in every field of science. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So and now we're going to have the certificate uh, handover. So to the committee members, please share the certificate. Okay, so thank you so much, Professor. This is the certificate we would like to present to you and we will send it to you directly to the committee members. Thank you very much. And now we will going to have the photo group photo session. So to the committee members who in charge, please uh, take your time. Um, okay, thank you for Mr. Dio and Professor Fuku. Uh, now I will take a photo of the participant. And for the participant who haven't turned on the camera, you can uh, turn on the camera first. Okay, uh, for on the first slide, please be ready. Uh, let me take a picture in one, two, three. Okay, for on the next slide, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think this is the end of uh, the second session. I would like to once again uh, express our gratitude to Professor Takasu who already joining us today. And we are really hope that uh, we can meet in person maybe in the next year. Thank you very much everyone. And I will give back the session to Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dio and Professor Takasu Fugo for the insightful talks. 
and also we apologize for the inappropriate action that happens during the second session. We will try to prevent those kind of action that will disturb the rest of the webinar. Before we continue, I would like to remind the participants to fill out the attendance form that has already been sent via chat box. Now, we're going to proceed to the last speakers, Professor Rui Ando from National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. For the last session, we will be accompanied by Dr. Eko Prasetyo Kuncoro. Dr. Eko Prasetyo Kuncoro is the head of environmental engineering in Universitas Erlangga. He got his bachelor in engineering from Institute Technology 10 November. And he continued his master's in industrial engineering and environmental engineering in France. He had a great interest in doing research about several topics such as wastewater treatment, air pollution, sustainable materials and energy, and also industrial ecology. He published his work on various seminars, conferences, symposiums, and various scientific journals. So let's give a big round of applause for both of them, and I will give the stage to Dr. Eko Prasetyo Kuncoro as the moderator for the last session. To Dr. Eko, the screen is yours. This one? Okay. Uh, thank you for the committee, for the occasion um, that uh, giving me as a moderator. Um, in this uh, last session, in the third session, uh, there will be a lecture given by Professor Ru Andong. Uh, before the lecture, I will uh, read the curriculum vitae of uh, Professor Rui Andong. Professor Rui Andong is a chair professor in the Institute of Analytical and Environmental Sciences, uh, National Tsinghua University. Uh, Professor Rui Andong uh, earned, got the PhD degree from Environmental Engineering National Taiwan University before he got the Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering National Ching. Chung Sing University. Um, at this time, the position of uh, Professor Rui Andong is so many here, a uh, convener program of environmental uh, engineering, Ministry of Science and Technology, Ma Taiwan, Din Tsinghua International College, National Tsinghua University, and uh, many other uh, positions. Uh, so we, we can see. Uh, many position of uh, Professor Rui Andong. Next, please. Uh, research interest of uh, Professor Rui Andong is in environmental nanotechnology for energy saving water and wastewater treatment, energy materials for energy storage, photo electrochemistry, biosensor, and nanosensing technology. He's also member of many uh, editor in the reputed uh, journal, such as Helium, Nanomaterials, Journal of Biosensor and Bioelectronics, and another. Uh, he has also uh, many occasions to be a uh, plenary keynote or invited speaker in many conference, uh, seminar, or um, symposium, like in this session uh, today. Okay, next please. Uh, Professor Endong also has uh, many international collaboration uh, with the University of Delaware, with the Asian, with the Malayan, UTM, and another, and also with the University of Erlangga, Universitas Erlangga, especially with the environmental engineering. Uh, Professor Endong supervised master and PhD students, mainly master and uh, PhD students uh, has been supervised by Professor Rui Andong. Okay. Uh, he has also many awards. <coughs> okay, 
please. And this is the publication, many publication of uh, uh, Professor Roy Andong. I think uh, we must end the the, the 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 lecture of the of the CV because uh, the CV is uh, until uh, almost fifty uh, pages. Um, so, Professor Roy Andong, uh, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Andrew. Thank you for um, um, uh, become the speaker in this uh, webinar series. So, time uh, and place is yours now. Okay, yes. thank you, thank you, Professor Echo. Uh, I think this should be the case. I would like to share to you. So that now you can see, right? Okay, yeah. So good morning. Uh, no, it's the uh, Yeah, yes, it's good morning uh, in Indonesia, but the should be good afternoon in Japan and uh, in Taiwan. Um, it's my great pleasure just to talk about a little bit different the topics uh, related to the other uh, <coughs> speakers uh, in uh, for. For, for names that they talk about the, the emerging pollutants that in water and talk about the, the AI and the, how to manage the, those pollutants and the names, the, how to manage all the resources by AI or IoT system. And I'm the, the technology guide, so that's the would like us to tell you the, how to use, especially to fabricate the, the nanomaterials to decompose chemicals. Uh, in water and uh, names how to recover the, the energies from water. So today the topics will be a little bit different from um, the other persons. We will talk about the, the photocatalytics properties of graphitic carbon nitride, only focus on one kind of the, uh, uh, carbon based material and for water energy. And this, uh, I'm random, and this is our campus. So. Today, we'll like to tell you around the four, four different kinds of the, uh, subtopic. This topic is highly related, and the names tell you that the concepts for the photo degradation as well as for photochemistry. Okay, yeah, so uh, first of all, would like us to introduce myself again. Uh, sorry for that. Like uh, uh, Professor Echo mentioned, um, now I'm the chair of professors of my, my institutes, also the Dean of the, the Tsinghua International College, also the, the two fellows, also got the, the Arizona Sahombo so Fellowships in 1999 to 2000. Uh, the publication is uh, relatively okay. Yeah, total citation is around the 10,000. Edge index uh, is quite okay. Uh, 61. So that means that that's the more than 61 paper has been cited for more than 61 times. I10 is uh, 155. Also, the top 2% that it is cited uh, in environmental science or wild. Okay. Tsinghua is a, a relatively good university or wild. At this moment, we have the 10 college, 30 department, 30 independent graduate institute. According to the QS rankings uh, uh, in 2021, we are the top of 186 uh, in the world. But our university is just a medium university. Our total faculty number is only is only at 850. So that if you talk about the, the full time academic uh, faculty, less than 1,000, that means that that's, that that's should be the, the middle sized one. Uh, our university, Tsinghua University, ranks the uh, top nine in the world. So this one actually is quite good. We also have the three, uh, for our alumni, we also have the three Nobel laureates. Yeah, and uh, so one's, one, one's awards from the, uh, the mathematics. Uh, from last year, uh, I'm the uh, visiting professors uh, and cooperate very tightly with the uh, University of Erlanga. So that's that we cooperate and discuss 
uh, quite the good ideas and names. Uh, we published uh, some papers. Last year, we I cooperated with uh, uh, four male students with Baman Dose. We, we have published more than nine, nine papers, and nine SCI papers, quite good. This year, I cooperated with Professor Echo and also cooperated with uh, Professor Davento. At this moment, we have published at SCI papers. Here is the sums. You can see that the uh, cooperates with Davento. That's the, uh, we published one paper in biosensor and bioelectronics. The impact factor is around 10.6. It actually is quite high in analytical chemistry. And sensor and accurate B is also one kind of name. So they have ship the top five uh, journal, also the Q1. And cooperated with Professor A. Coast, we talked about the, the carbon, carbon dose and graphite carbon nitride. This, this journal, chemical engineering journal, now should be the, the top two or top three in environmental engineering as well as the, in chemical engineering. Their impact factor is 13.3. That's the relatively high, relatively high. So that's the, we cooperate quite well and published quite a good journals here. Okay, then talk about the, the, the topics today. We are talking about the, the, the things here, especially talk about the, the energy and water. So that's the here we would like us to know is that that's the, um, if we would like us to know if what is the uh, what, sorry? What is the, the major topics worldwide at this moment? So that's the from the U UNEP. They point out that the climate change, energy, food, and water should be the one of the, the most important issue. So that's the here you always will see that that's, that's the climate change. We we talk we talk about a lot of things to be that is just to zero zero emissions and the climate climate, uh, uh, global warming, some others. And for energy is one of the case we need. The food is also one, one, one of the case we need. So that's the, that, that is the, the case we are trying to talk. Yeah, it is very important for us just to see here. But when we talk about this, the, the Earth, always have the something circulates on the Earth. So that's the, when we talk about this, the, the most important cycles on, on the Earth. First one is energy. Second is what? Second is water. Third one should be material, like uh, carbon, the, like uh, material, like iron, and all the minerals. And names that should be carbon. So when we put these two together, and uh, names we definitely will know that's the water and energy are the most important issues in the world, not only for human beings or for the earth. Names, water, uh, energy should be one of them. According to these ideas, the names, we also have the several important items that were wild. Definitely one of them is the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, SDG. And names that now people all move to the SDG to the 2050 net zero emission, okay? Like Maya mentioned, net zero water or waste emission is also one kind of the net zero emission, even though people are talking about 2050 net zero carbon emission, but all should be related, okay? So, so that's the, that should be very important because when we talk about the, the, the water energy net, water energy net thirst here, you always will know that that's, that's the, uh, uh, they were uh, one of them in SDG. And this topic actually is also very important in Asian country, also very, very important worldwide. So that is the, the case we would like us to, 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 to mention. And names, if you talk about the, the other cases, you always will know Global water challenge is one of the, the uh, one of the, the most important issues. Okay, especially in 2003, a uh, Nobel laureate Richard E. Smiley, uh, he gave a very important uh, uh, speech. He talked about the, the topic humanity is the top ten problems for next fifty years. By the way, that's the, the this talk was given in 2003. In 2003. 
and named is the 2020. At this moment, we find that the energy water for environment poverty, terrorist and um, education is one of the, the most important. And all this topic, all this topic, all this problem actually has been raised in 2003 by Nobel laureates, Richard E. Smiley. Uh, uh, Richard E. Smiley actually he gets the, the Nobel laureate in chemistry. He finds that the fullery means that that's carbon 60. So it is very important uh, for us just to know Water and energy is one of them. When we talk about the, the water and the topic uh, today is water and waste water. So we have the, uh, huge numbers, huge numbers of water in the world, but most of them are sea water. We cannot use it. We cannot use it. So that's the here, here is the, the case. If we cannot use it, the names, we need to find some available water. And so if we talk about the, 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 the the type of the water name uh, around sea water is around the 97.5%, and then follows the fro frozen fresh water and underground, they also around the 2.5. It means that that's the, the water resource available to mankind actually is the this name 0 0.01. I always say that the, uh, if we have the one liters of the waters, one liter of the water in the world, and uh, names the most fresh water available fresh water we can use is only one drop of those water. It means that that's the less than 0 0.05 milliliter. So we have almost uh, uh, 7.5 billion population in the world now. And in 2050, the population will increase this to 9 billion. For those 9 billion people, we only can use the one drop of the water compares just to one liter of water. So the water resources actually is very important. So that we need this to provide this, the, the safe water, we need that to provide the, the clean water, we also need this to provide the, the sufficient of water quantity. All this actually is very important. So that's the now the, the thinking is that that's how to implement the, those ideas that, that we can use the water very, very simply or we can use the water very, very safely. So that's the, in the real world, the pollution is everywhere, and usually quite visible and perceptive for, for this item. You always will see, you always will see, we can see that the, the color of the water change, or that I have the something floating on the, uh, on the water, we know that it is uh, uh, some contamination. So the problem is that if we find it is very dirty, a name tries to identify what is the, the pollutant inside. Water is a uh, fluid that they can froze with time. So that's the, we need to find the source. We need to know how to transport a name, identify what is the, the pollutant. A name tries to take, take the, the strategies for treatment or for cleanup. Name, those pollutant has gone. Okay, so it is the really labor and time consuming. So that's the way I'm thinking about the, the case is that how to try to trace the lost pollutant from macro technologies to nanotechnology, how to do that the, from the lab works the, to in situ, it is very important. In addition to here, the uh, names we think about that now, so we also use a lot of the uh, materials for water treatment. For the traditional water and waste water treatment, we always use the membrane, activated carbon, resin, or the sand filtration, or use the, some catalyst. All this actually will be from the, the commercial products. But now, if we can try to cultivate or try to prepare the lowest materials we want, then we can design the, their own property. So that's the, that is the, the case. If we can try to prepare our own material with tunable and controllable property, that will be good for us because we can try to, to emphasize the, some, pro, some property that is good to degrade the, some chemicals. So that is the, the case. We try to develop the environmental nanotechnology because in environmental engineering, we use a lot of materials, okay, that membranes or 
catalyst. Okay, yeah. So, so that's the today would like us to tell you is one kind of the DLP process. That means that that's we're talking about the, the catalyst. There's a lot of photocatalyst or the some others as uh, as uh, 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 catalyst or the reductive the catalyst there. For example, zinobin iron is one of the, the catalysts that can reduce the, the chlorinated chlor compounds. And some as a goal is also one of them that's to reduce the, the nitrophenol. And the, for oxidations, photodegradation is one of them. So that's the, when we talk about the, the photocatalysis, then we miss the, the photocatalyst here. For the photocatalyst, we always have the, the balance band and conduction band. So that's, you know, electrons will be in the balance band. If they receive the, the electron, uh, uh, receives, receives the, the energy and names that's to let the electron jump from the valence band to conduction band, and names electron will meet up. So near here in the valence band will produce hole. So we call this one is the hole electron pair. So in that case, a name that your electron will move the, to the surface, hole will also remove to the surface. So that's the hole will re react with the, the donor, a name that becomes the, the free radical. Electron will, re will be received by an acceptor. So we use A, a name becomes a free radical. So that's the here, you always will see that the hole and electron will be the main part of the uh, after the irradiation of the electron, a name that will produce a lot of radical here. So here is just only one kind of the, the radicals of the production you can see. The, adv the advantage here is that, that they can do the very fast reaction rate because it produces a lot of radical, especially hydroxyl radical, and their conversion efficiency will be good. Uh, names you can operate under normal condition, not, no need to use the high temperature or high pressure. So for that idea, the names we will know that's the for those the photocatalyst names that they can use as the, the pure photocatalyst. Or you can add some electrons for names and then they can form the, the photoelectron catalyst, means that that's, you can try to produce energy like just the, the water spritting and some others. You also can use the, this photocatalyst to serve as the, the sensors to detect the chemicals inside. So today we would like us to, to focus this on the photo or properties so that we will talk about the major for photocatalysis and the uh, small parts of the, the photoelectrocatalysis here. So there are so many. If you talk about the, the semiconductor, one of the, the most important is the titanium dioxide, TL2. The band gap of TL2 is from three electron volts to 3.2 electron volts. The names that they need is that the, the a uh, wavelength around the 380s to, to 400. It is not good for us now because we hope that, that we can use the, the visible light. So in sunlight, the strongest wavelength is around 500 nanometers uh, in sunlight. So that we hope that that's we can try to utilize this, the, the wavelength across the to 500 nanometer. Graphite carbon nitride is one kind of the, the carbon base material, their band gap is around the 2.7. Okay, yeah, so they can receive the full 60 nanometer. And it's the two-dimensional material, so that's that their surface areas can be good if you can separate it in, in a very good way. Our uh, names that they only contain carbon and nitrogen, so that's that they use that the sp2, so that's that they why they based the, the two-dimensional because that they hybridize with carbon and nitrogen with st with sp2, so it's a plane, okay? Uh, since the band gap is 2.7, so that we can use the, the visible light just to do, yeah, so that is the case. And the fabrication of your of our graphite carbon nitride is quite simple. We can use the different kinds of the, the precursor, like a urea or cyourea or melamine and some others to prepare. So all these chemicals are relatively simple and uh, cheap, so that's we can try this to do. And here is the, the case, if you try to combine carbon and nitrogen together and the names that they can form different kinds of the, the st structure, so that's the, their 
nitrogen oil with a little bit different uh, names, and they also can provide the, some Lewis phase, the Lewis acid or prostate A phase, so that the, they can, and sometimes that they can serve us the, the electron donor, sometimes they can serve us the, the electron acceptor, so that's the, that will be good for us. And they have the, some resonance property, for example, here, is the, the resonance property, so that's the, the, the electron transfers will be re relatively fast. So according to this fundamental concept, you 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 can image that as the graphite carbon nitride will have the good property for electron transfer, their electron chemical property will be good, and their band gap is only 2.7, so that their optical property will be also good. So they have the good optical and electrochemical properties so that they can do a lot of things. For example, here is the case. We can do the carbon dioxide photo reduction. We can try to degrade the pollutant. We can try this to use the uh, graphite carbon nitride to transfer the organic. Also try to try this to kill the bacteria like uh, COVID-19 or some virus and bacteria to do the disinfection and also can do the, the photo electron chemistry for water spreading. So all this actually is the their application. So if we would like us to all this application in this figures that they should be in, in green, and then we need the, to think about what kinds of the, the property we can emphasized so that we can do the band gap and you nearly try to let their band gaps a little bit smaller and then we can control their difference the, the, the names to can accept electron or try to separate the whole and electrons very very efficiently we also can try this to to control their pole size and some others so that is the, the case we can do so for us, if we would like us to do the, the environmental engineering for water and wastewater treatments the, to fulfill the, the SDG or the, to fulfill the, the Z, net zero wastewater emission, and then we select the, the photo degradation names, we can think about what kinds of the, the property we can do. We definitely can do the, the photo degradation. We also can do the water spray paint, carbon dioxide reduction, and disinfection. All these actually are highly related to environmental engineering or even for chemistry. We also can do. Okay, so this material actually is quite good for us to do. Some papers talk about the, the different dimension. That means that that's the, the Dimension has also some effects to degrade chemicals. So that's the, we can try to fabricate one dimension. Okay, sometimes we can try to prepare the three dimension. For example, this quite nice that the uh, three dimensional flower types is the, the combination of the TaO2 with graphite carbon nitride. They can decompose the, the antibiotics. So that means that that's the, we can decompose the, some emerging pollutants very fast only around the 10 to 15 minutes. That will be good for us. But today, I only talk about the, the uh, two-dimensional case, and the names that tries to merge with the, some other metal oxide or other materials to form the, the graphite carbon nitride nano composite. Okay, we do not have the, so much time just to talk about all the story here, especially for the one-dimensional or for the three-dimensional, even those that they have to quite a nice the results in my lab. Okay, so that's the now so we'll talk about the, the photo degradation. And then very briefly is just to let you know that that's the uh, four lost photo degradation, we usually will have the three different kinds of the reaction mechanism. One, we call it Schottky junction. We call it Schottky junction photo degradation behavior. Second is the, the PN heterojunction. Third one is the, the G scheme. So today, I, we don't talk about the, the Schottky junction because the, this technique is has been well established. That means that we have the, the photo or catalyst the semiconductor with one metal together. No matter you use the gold, you use the copper, you use the platinum, and then if you have the, the semiconductor metal oxide with one metal together, and then that they always will form the, the Shakti junction barrier there. So that's that they were quite good for photo degradation. Okay, yeah. So that 
but the, 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 the reaction mechanism is quite well established. Second is that the PN heterogeneous junction means that we have the two photocatalysts. We have two semiconductors. Uh, their band gap is a little bit different. Sometimes that the electron will flow from, uh, from one semiconductor to another, and the name says that the hole will flow on the same direction. In that case, we call this one is type one heterogeneous junction. We don't like we don't like this case. We like the, the type two heterojunction. Type two heterojunction is the, the real PN heterojunction. Okay, that, that means that the electron flow from the, the one semiconductor to another, um, but the, the hole flows the, in the opposite side, opposite size. They flow from the, the, the another uh, semiconductor to the original one. So that's the they hold an electron can separate. And a name type three definitely is that we don't like it. Okay, yeah, because that they do not have any electron flows in between the, the semiconductors. So that's what we talked about the, the PN keto junction. This game we'll talk about later on. But now you will know that now we talk about the, the PN keto junction means that that's the they hold an electron will create in different semiconductor. One case we are trying to talk is we use the vanadium oxide with boron topis graphite carbon nitride. The fabrication is very simple. We just use urea. We are names that to form the, the graphite carbon nitride. And names that puts the, the boric acid inside. Names that they were quite easy for us that's to form the, the boron topis uh, graphite carbon nitride. And names that for the V205, we also use the very simple ways to use. We use the, the precursor with the citric acid and names that they can easy to form the, the vanadium the oxide the semiconductor. So that's the, that is the, the case. And the name that they form the, the PN keto junction here, you can see that's the names that we can try to see, to see the electron and the whole jumps with will be something that here, okay? So it will be the good for us that because that they can try to produce the, the whole and electron uh, at, on the surface of the different photocatalysts. We use the, this type the, to decompose the, some pharmaceutical waste water. And in this case, we try to, to degrade the, the diclofenac, one kind of the painkillers, one kind of pain, pain, painkillers uh, drug. Okay, yeah. So the Fabrication is quite simple. You can see that's the from the, the, the SEM. Okay, we always will see that the little forms that the, to their structure, and then we put the, the little particle on the surface. And we also change this the, the weight percentage of the, the vanadium oxide from 10 weight percent to 90 weight percent. The surface area is the, not high enough compared to the graphite carbon nitride. They are quite low. But that their photodegradation efficiency will be good enough. You can see here is the, the case when we just talk about the, the pure graphite carbon nitride and boron topis the graphite carbon nitride, and then that tries this to do the other. And then that the band gap here, uh, 50 to 75 percent of brandium uh, oxide will be good because that the band gap only around 2.2 to 2.3. Okay, so that's the names that, that we can see that they can receive the, the, the wavelengths around the 500 nanometers. So the nearest uh, quantum efficiency will be relatively good for us. So that's the we use the this materials that's two. We use the this materials to decompose the, the diclofenac and names the, from your right hand side in the, the right corner, you can see that's the direct constant. 50% will be the highest one. So it means that they have the quite a low, quite a low uh, uh, band gap, but there's the degradation efficiency. But when we, when we going back to their, sur their surface area, well, 50% that their uh, uh, surface area is the, that's the, the highest one. So it means that that's the, their surface areas here is the that the main main parameters to control their photodegradation efficiency. And then the actors that determines 50 percent is the, the best one. And then we try this to lose the different 
and percentage of the borrow, and then here we from the zeros to 10 percent the borrow, and we will find that the five way percent of borrows will be the best. Okay, yeah, so that is the case here. And we also try to do a lot of things, including that there's uh, inference on their and IOs and names, how to replace the, the case. And then we also try to identify this, the, the case and before and after the, the photo degradation. We always believe that that's the full loss photo catalysis. There's physical chemical properties should be the same before and after the, the reaction. And from the, the SRD patterns, we can see that they form a similar pattern. It means that that's before and after the degradation, our materials are the same. So that will be the good way. So we try to propose that there are possible reaction mechanism here. We have the vanadium oxide with boron doping carbon nitride and names. You always will see that the holes will produce on the surface of the boron doping uh, graphite carbon nitride, they will be whole, and then it, electron will be on the surface of the vanadium oxide. So they always can produce the, the superoxide anion radical as well as the, they can produce the, the OH radical here so that the, they can decompose the, the uh, pollutants very fast. So according to these ideas, you can try this to combine different kinds of the metal oxides with the graphene carbon nitride, and you also can try to dump some an ion of can ions uh, inside the, the graphene carbon nitride. For example, here is the, the case, we use the, the sodium oxide with another kind of the photocatalyst, and we still use the, the carbon nitride here, but still here we dump it with uh, ion dyes and potassium, so they still can form the, the pn keto junction and names that they can try this to decompose the one one pen keto uh, acetaminophen. So that will be the good way for us. We can try to see, yeah, okay. So that is the, the main ideas for us uh, to do. And you also try this to fabricate that your graphite carbon nitride into the Z scheme, but the if you want to form the G scheme, then you need this to select the your photocatalyst, another photocatalyst with care, because the uh, sometimes they will form the, the PN heterojunction, sometimes they will form the G scheme. So it's the totally depends on their band gap structure. Okay, so here is the, the case for the PN heterojunction, so that you can see that the their electron and hole flows will be a little bit different, okay, yeah. But uh, when you see, so that's, you can see that's the they can form from, from the, this one. but the, for the Z scheme, they always will do something like here, okay, it's the will be do from here and then from here. So it will be very different. So keto junction, Z scheme, and Z scheme, you can see that's the, they can have the, uh, the direct Z scheme, they can still from here and then from here, and then from here, okay, so that is the, the direct Z scheme. And you also can do the indirect Z scheme, means that, that you jump to here, and then you have the some mediator accepts that your electron, and then transfers to another, and then to jump again, okay. All this actually we will talk, talk about is that the Z scheme, because that the electron flow will be similar like a Z, okay. Is the many from the, the photosynthesis system. So in that case, we need the two have the two case. One is have the PS2, the other is the, the PS1 means that we have needs the two have the, the photosystem one and photosystem two. <coughs> okay, yeah. So in that case, we would like us to use the, the Z scheme and names. We still use the, the graphite carbon nitride and names. In another, in another, in another case, we try to, to select. Another photocatalyst is bismuth vanadium oxide. And then so we use the nitrogen topic carbon dots, okay, as the their mediator. So that's the, the nitrogen dots, the, the carbon dots is the, the zero dimensional carbon dots. The, their particle size were less than 10 nanometer. And they have some very, very good electrochemical property as well as the full optical property. So that's that they can service the, the good mediator here. So 
The idea is quite simple. We try to fabricate the, the graphitic, uh, uh, no, sorry, we try to fabricate the, the nitrogen dots, carbon dots. We use citric acids to do. Uh, names that the EDTA, something like here, so like the nitrogen source to form the, the NCD. And uh, then we use the urea to prepare the, the graphitic carbon nitride similar to the previous one. And then tries to use the, the precursors to form the, the bismuth monadium the, uh, carbon nanotube. So that's the here when we fabricate name after the hydrolysis, we form the, the semiconductor, but then the shaft will be the one dimensional. So that's the, that's the carbon nanotubes. That means that they have the one dimensional here. So that's the here, the, when we mix up together, this material contains the two dimensionals, the graphite carbon nitride, one dimensionals, this must monodium uh, oxide, and zero dimensional uh, uh, nitrogen top, uh, carbon dose. So that's the, the material contain zero, one, and two dimension here. So that's the, we try to use it, and then you will see that from the SEM and TM, we can see that the, this is the, the Graphite carbon nitride and name, so we can see this is the, the, the case for one dimensional the, the bismuth monadium oxide. And name, so we can assist the carbon dose because the particle size is the less than 10. Usually, they only have the 5 to 6. So that's from the here we can see. But from the high resolution TMs, we can see that this spatial is only around the 0 0.24 and 0 0.1. So that's what we can see. Okay, yeah, here. And we also try to identify that they are photocurrent so that you can see that when, when they merge them together, names that their photocurrent can be enhanced dramatically. And therefore, their optical property, when they merge them together, and names, you can see that the, the blue lines, they was the try to do the, the, the quite a good photo realization. So that is the, the case. Okay, yeah. So it means that the, when we merge this the stream with material together, the optical as well as electrochemical property will be good. Uh, this slide is a bit, a little bit, uh, uh, Busy, but the, the most important here is that that's the we try to identify what kind of the, the functional groups on the surface. So here we always can find that the, the they have the, the carbon nitrogen carbon. So that's the it means that that's the, the, the they form the quite a nice carbon nitride. And here is also the case. But the, they also have a lot of, of oxygen containing functional group. It, mean, it means that that's the they have the, the, some um, oxygenated the functional groups and that the surface will be very hydrophilic. So this material can attack, can attack the pollutants quite, quite easily. So that is the, the case here. So we try to, to use the, this material just to, uh, to digress the, the, the pollutants. We use the different kinds of the, 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 the Emerging pollutant CIP, uh, ciprofloxacin is one kind of the antibiotics widely used in human beings as well as in animals. Yeah, especially in Vietnam, so in Southeast Asian country, we use a lot of ciprofloxacin to control the disease, especially for seafood, uh, for farmer also for. Fishermen and they just uh, 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 put a lot of ciprofloxacin in water. Okay, yeah, they don't care about whether the, the concentration is too high or too low. So that's the, a lot of the, uh, water has been contaminated has been contaminated by CIP. Okay, yeah. So we try we that is the one of the reasons why we focus on this pollutant. So that's the, here you can see that we if we want. Just use the, the, the purest carbon nitrides, the, the degradation is very slow. It means that that's the CIP is quite hard, very, very difficult to decompose. And when you mix this uh, street together and name, it seems quite good. And names we also can degrade uh, to determine the red constant and as also different pH value and also try to see. One of the, the, the characteristics is here, so we try to identify the, the Red constant at different pH value. So that's the we try to use the, the 
chemistry point of views that's to determine their K value. Uh, acidic path, neutron path, or was the, the best path, a name that we can monitor it quite well. So that it means that that's the claims that the water's environment have different kinds of pH value, we all can predict in a very good way. It is the something like uh, the, the AIoT system. Okay, yeah, but the we only have the very limited the data cannot be 1,000 or the one of the 10,000 data. Otherwise, that will be very, very interesting for us just to use the AIT stage to predict the, the reconstance the, for different kinds of the, the water environment. We also try to identify the, the different kinds of the, the parameter here. Here you always will see that the, from the name of his words or the from the IO, so we always can can fit quite a well. So it means that that's the our photocatalyst can be tuned according to our source, and then that they can decompose it in a very good way. So from the the air water, from the neck waters, from the the air waters, from the the neck. Like water, you always can see that the they can repeat for at least five time, and they can produce different kinds of the radical. Even for after fifteen minutes, that they can produce quite a good way. Our names we also try to identify the the different species that they produce according to these results. The names we can make sure that that's the uh lay uh, I think I can skip this one. Our names, you can see that's the daily reaction mechanism is something like here. So that's the, the electron flows will be from here. Our names that are uh, received by the NC, okay? Our names that jumps again from here. So that's the there's something like the Z scheme. So that's the, you always will see that's the hole will be here, hole will be here. So that's the, they can produce the, the radical here. You They can produce Radical here, a name to, to degrade that the ciprofloxacin, a name that they can form the electron here, and electron will react with oxygen, becomes the, the superoxide and ion radical, and then produce the, the hydrogen peroxide against the, the hydroxyl radical again, and names that should decompose. So that is the, the case we can see. We can see. Okay, yeah. Use the same ideas, names that we try to improves the, 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 the water treatment system. We are not just only to decompose chemical, we try to, to recover the, the energy. So that's the, if we can use the, the electrochemical system with the uh, sunlight, the names that we will form the, the photoelectrochemical system. So here is the, the case, use the, the photoelectrochemical degradation of another kinds of the, the emerging pollutant, the names that they can degrade the, the tries Method print quite effectively a name as well as just to produce the, the hydrogen per, uh, production. We use the almost the same materials the, like the, the nitrogen dropped the carbon nitride and graphite carbon nitride, but we just uh, change the bismuth molybdenum oxide into the, the iron oxide. Iron oxide is quite common in environmental engineering as well as the, the in chemistry. But we change the from the, the from the mismus molybdenum oxide that's to iron oxide. Because of all the photoelectrochemicals, a lot of the research is means the less the, the bang gap of the, the uh, one material should be around the uh, 1.7, 2.4. That means that that's the 1.7, 1 1.7 1 to 2.4, 2.4 electron volt. Um, this most molybdenum oxide is 2.7, it's the relatively high, so that we change to the, the iron oxide, that will be good. So that we hope that that's the, from the anode, from the anode, that they can do the oxidation. From the cathode, they can try this to produce hydrogen gas here. So that's the, the idea and the preparation will be the same. We just the changes the from the, 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 the BI, okay, into the, the iron oxide, so that's what we just prepared here. So the procedure are almost the same, so I don't need this to, 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 to repeat it. So that's the here, you can see that we can see that the, this shape is the, the 
iron oxide, we can see that the NCD here, okay, a name that we also can identify is quite a good way. So here is the, the, the case, I think uh, so we only need 10, uh, 10 minutes left, so that maybe we don't need to talk it. So here is the, the case when, so we try to merge them together, so that's the for the photo anode, is the to do the oxidation. So this part is for photo anode, so that's the, we try to, to use the, the different kind of case, use the, the PEC, FO, CNFO, and some others, and the next decomposed, we always will see that's the, use the, the nitrogen dope is the carbon nitride with the, the uh, graphite carbon nitride with iron oxide, names that the degradation will be good, okay, yeah. And we also try to, to know that the initial concentration and some others, this one is for photo anode and the photo cathodes. They can try to receive electron, and this this electrons can be used for water to do the water splitting, and names that they can try to produce hydrogen gas. So that's the here is the case. We can see that they can produce quite a nice that's the hydrogen gas. So a name from the still that's the repeat again and again and again, and this for five times. The hydrogen production are almost in the same range, almost in the same range. Uh, names that the TMP removal for the uh, here is the, the TMP removal. They are so quite good. So it means that that's the, this system, when you use the this for water and methods for anode decomposed chemical cathodes to, to produce energy hydrogen gas. They still can do the same way, and their performance are uh, independent. The uh, names that the degradation efficiency and the, the production efficiency are always good. Okay, yeah, so that is the, the case here. So we try to, to identify that there are possible mechanisms similar to choose the, the uh, degradation of C CIP. We still try to find that that's the they use. The, Iron oxide and names that use the, the two the, the nitrogen topic carbon dose and the names the two the graphite carbon nitride. So that will be the case here. And names here they always produce hole here and electron here. So that's that they can try these two forms the, the case. Since they have the, the oxygen here, so that's that they, the electron cannot be, be received by water. So that's the four. Cathode, you need this to purge with other names that they do not have so the oxygen inside. So electrons can be used, can be used by water to produce the hydrogen gas here. We also use this, the, the graphite carbon nitride with the, some other case. So the case is the two-dimensional graphite carbon nitride. We try this to change into one-dimensional graphite carbon nitride here, you can see. Okay, and we use the two-dimensional phosphorin here. A name tries to, to deposit that this one is the, the CN. Okay. A name that this one is the, the two-dimensional case, the phosphorin, sim, similar, similar, similar like this, the, 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 the nanoparticle, but unfortunately is the, 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 the nanoparticle is the two-dimensional nano sheet. So that's the we try to merge them together, and the name always does know that the graphite carbon nitride band gap is 2.7. Uh, named for the phosphorine, the band gap is this 2.2. So that's the they can do the P and heterojunction, junction, not the, the Z scheme. So we you, we use the this ones this to decompose us uh, this to produce hydrogen gas. So that's the here is the, the case. We try to merge with the six wave percent of the Phosphorin on the surface of the one dimensional graphite carbon nitride. And names you always will see that's the, from the different kinds of the, the potentials, there's the uh, photo current density decrease. So that it means that, that, that they are quite good. They are quite good for the photocathodes, okay, because they need this to be operated uh, under negative potential so that's that they can serve as the, the, the cathode. Here is another case when you change this to different kinds of the, the uh, uh, phosphorin from the 2 4 percent to 18 percent. A name you always will see. A name will see that the third 
we will see that the thirteen weight percent will be the best one. Okay, yeah. So here you always will see the color here is that the thirteen weight percent is the, the highest one. Okay, yeah. So that we use the this one a uh, name that's to become two tries to, to produce the, the hydrogen gas. And then you can see here, there's an in the very quite a good ways that's to increase linearly with time. So that's the, the hydrogen evolution is high. So using the 13 weight percent and the names that they can try to produce quite a good, quite a good, good, good hydrogen gas and the names that they can try to do uh, again and again and again. So that's the their psychoabilities will be also quite a good. So but there is a, we talk about a lot of the story related to two graphite carbon nitride and names that they cannot just only use as the, the photocatalyst, but they also can serve as the, the electrochemical catalyst or just combine them together into the photo electrocatalyst. So that's the graphite carbon nitride actually is not just only for this case, but they also can serve as the, the, the supposed for nano catalysts like gold and like iron, like some others to enhance the, the electron transfer. So that will be good. Second is that the, this material actually can top with the element of metal oxide, the, for example, like uh, uh, bolons, the, like iodide, potassium, or new names that merge with the different kinds of metal oxide and names that they can have the quite a good surface area and names that their less the response will be good and names that their photo in, induce the charge separation will be good so that's that they can quite a good for green and multi-functional carbon materials that's to do the photo and optical or the electrochemical application for environmental sustainability, especially for water and waste water treatment. Okay. Finally, would like us to do one announcement. Uh, in uh, um, during November twenty fourth to December 9th, we will have the, uh, one one workshops talk about the. the SDG and then zero emission. We will provide the total 45 hour courses, including the, the course, including the, the technical demo and full time meeting and one special seminar. Uh, names just to talk about the, the, the SDG and net zero emission in Asian country. Okay, yeah. So if you are interested in that, that you can try to find our application form from Google Form. And names that they will be here. The deadlines still have the one week. Okay, deadlines will be October 18. Okay, so that's hopes that you can you can join us. Okay, yeah, here. Yeah. So thank you for your kind attention. I'm so happy, more than happy to answer the question. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Roy Andong. You have uh gave us a uh, uh, very interesting and very valuable uh, material for um, this uh, last session. Okay, uh, for the audience, if you have uh, any question, please raise hand or directly uh, ask uh, to Professor Roy Andong. Okay. Or you can uh, write in the chat box. Okay, um, I would like to ask uh, Professor Andong. Um, uh, the use of uh, this uh, nanomaterial is uh, uh, quite important, I think, in the future. What yeah. about the what about the application at this time? It is still in the lab scale, or um, uh, there's also an application in the pilot plan, something like that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Professor Echoes. Uh, actually, that's the, uh, people always talk about that's the, the real application for nanomaterials. Um, the nanomaterials cannot be used as the, the main, main bodies uh, uh, for real application. They cannot be something like the membranes or activated carbon. But the, they can serve as the, the some additives. For example, you try just to add the 10% or the 20% of 
of the errors in material and names that they can enhance this, this, the case very, 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 very efficiently. We now that we try this to stop the some good little materials that are into the biochar bio and also try this to, to, to cultivate the biochar into the, the nano scale properties. And then we find that that's the, the property actually is quite, quite good. So there's the, another the, uh, story. If we would like us to use the, the biochar as the one kind of the carbon material, Material and then we only need this just to stop the very trace amounts of our nanomaterial like graphite carbon nitride and some other nanomaterial on the surface. Their efficiency are the same, are the same. So that is the case here. Okay, yeah. So we cannot use this the main body, but this, we can use this, 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 the some additives, but the efficiency will be the same. Okay, yeah. I saw the, the, the one uh, two crutches from the chain box. Yeah, one is the best. I saw the, the synthesis of the, the graphene with other material for some application like photocatalyst and so on. So is that there any other material can perform better than graphemes in this application? Or maybe there is the special reason why graphene is used in most of uh, Thank you for your uh, uh, comments. Uh, First, actually, uh, carbon nitride is one is just one kind of the two dimensional. Is the not the, the graphemes? We also the, we also the, do a lot of work related to the graphene, graphene oxide, and reduced graphene oxide. At this moment, the people don't talk about the, the graphene or the, some others because the, uh, graphene has been been discovered since 1991. So that's the now people talk about the, the two-dimensional nanomaterial beyond graphene. So that's the uh, graphene carbon nitride is one of the, the, the materials the, to, to replace graphene. But now a lot of people try to use the another, another carbon-based materials to replace graphene carbon nitride. Uh, but the, it's the not so easy. So at this moment, people would like us to use the, the biochar and try to, to prepare the, the, the two-dimensional like or the graphene like the biochar to do. The efficiency will be quite good. In addition to the carbon-based material and the four, the other two-dimensional, people use the different kinds of like the, the phosphorine I introduced is one of them. And some other people use the Silicon means that that's the all the structure only silicon, or aluminum that means that that's all the all, all the chemical only contains aluminum. But the all this one actually is the, the double bond, so that's the the energy as well as the, the preparation is the, that's so easy. Yeah, and phosphorin means that that they only contain phosphorus is one of the, the simplest way we can prepare from the, the break. Forest. So that is the, the case. So uh, graphene is one of the, the good material. Graphene carbon nitride is also one of the, the good material. Uh, names another person tries to use the two dimensional so, well, narrow material. Okay. In addition to those one, a lot of people use the, the, the TMD transitions, this metal, uh, metal chuck G9. Okay, yeah, so that's the they call it the D TMD. Okay, yeah, but they contains the, the sulfur for water and waste water treatment. We seldom use the sulfur for names because then that will be relatively difficult for us. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So that is the, the that, that is the case. And then the second is the, that in photocatalytic the treatments, I saw that you recycle the, the, the process until three times under the similar trend. What happened in the fourth and is there any special treatment? Uh, actually, it depends on time. Theoretically, for photocatalytic, we, we request for five times. But the four or five times, it means that, that you need to, to do that that's the process for around six hours. Okay, yeah. So it's the totally 
depends on the time, how much time you want to spend. So if you can move the nose case in uh, under the sunlight, definitely you can try to do the whole day. But for us, we try to do the, the uh, three times is the, the minimum. Most of the time we do the five times, and sometimes we do the, the 10 times. We also do the cycle until the, the rate constant the decrease dramatically. Yeah, so that is the, the case here. Okay, yeah, so that is the case. Yeah, okay. Another question, please. Okay, um, I think um, uh, the most interesting uh, uh, for the use of uh, this material is also for uh, energy production. Uh, and energy production is, uh, uh, in this case, you have explained the production of uh, Hydrogen, is it right? So, yes. And uh, for this uh, gases, produce it uh, hydrogen during the experiments or uh, activity in the lab. Uh, can we storage uh, this uh, hydrogen, this gases? Uh, yes, definitely we can. Uh, for the hydrogen production, actually, this, this idea has been uh, uh, proposed in 1971 from the Professor Fujimoto. Yeah, okay, yeah. Until uh, now, the people st still use the, the same ideas for the hydrogen production. Uh, the difference is that that's the, uh, the, the photocatalyst we use is the different. In 1974, the names that he used the TL2, but now so we use the different kind. So that's the now so that the, the technology is good enough. So I believe that that could be the, the good way for us to produce hydrogen from the waste water. Um, it is also very important in 2050 because when we talk about the, the zero emissions, net zero emission, we always need energy. And, hyd and hydrogen economy is now very important worldwide. So that's the now a lot of countries talk about the, the hydrogen, talk about the, the hydrogen economy. Okay, no matter from the, the natural gas or the from the, the some reformation, but the they all talk about is that the gray a hydrogen or just talk about the, the blue. Yeah, okay. So first, if we use the, the waters to decompose, especially the main, main energy from sunlight, and then we can talk about this is the, the green, green hydrogen economy. So that will be good in 2050. So that's what we can try to store them and them during the, the daytime, we can store the energy used at the fuel cell, and at night, we can try to use it. So it is okay for us. And then so that is very, very important. Uh, one concept is that that's the full environmental engineering. We try to decompose chemicals, okay, no matter for COD or VOD from water, and then we say that's that the water is clean. But Certain people think about if you decompose the loss, the COD, VOD, you're still in the oxidation. Oxidation means that that's the your energy will be lost. So is that possible to recover lost energy? The answer definitely is yes. So that's the for environmental engineering. And now people talk about the, the energy saving technology, not just only for the traditional case. So water energy methods will be very, very important in the next 10 years for environmental engineering. Yeah, because all the energy needs to be re recycled and re all the uh, reserve. Yeah, it is very important case. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, please, from the audience. Excuse me. Mr. Yes, please. There are questions in the comment box. Yeah, please. Mr. Reiko, there are questions in the comment comment panel. Mm -hmm. 
Great. I can last hear hear that the part terms quite clear. Can you repeat it again? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Echo. There are questions in the comment panel. I um, will look at it. Yeah. Please, you can oh. ask uh, directly. The question in the conversation is already answered by Professor Endong, I think. Uh, yeah, it's already. You see? Okay, you mean that's the four, four, the, four is two questions? Yeah, it's already answered by Professor yeah, 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 Endong. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's already done. Okay. In just in case, maybe you people miss it. Okay, okay. yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Another question, please. You can ask. Okay, I think um, um, I'll try to uh, do some resume for this uh, last session. Um, Professor Wei Andong explain about us about the uh, gravity carbon nitrate. Uh, this is a uh, nanocomposite that is very important for um, water air energy uh, nexus and um, issues about uh, water energy is uh, very important at this time and also it related with the sustainable development goal and also carbon neutral or net zero emission uh, professor we andong uh, explain us about the uh, nanocomposite as the materials, the tunable and uh, controllable properties. And there are several uh, examples of uh, these nanomaterial, nanomaterials um, with the addition of uh, other materials uh, like metal, organic, and also with the uh, heterojunction. And for these nanomaterials, it explains that it's not only for um, pollutants degradation, and also, but also for energy production, such as uh, hydrogen uh, production. And maybe uh, Professor Anding, Roy Andong uh, can give a closing statement. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation also. Thanks, uh, uh, Professor Echoes. Um, water and uh, water and wastewater treatments, uh, we, we only use the very traditional ways to clean up the, the, the water's pollutants inside. But the, that is the, 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 the traditional ideas at this moment, the people always talk about the, the, the energy savings, the uh, wastewater treatment system for next generation. So that's the now people would like us to use this to the, the try to decompose the, the, the chemicals simultaneously. For example, the, like AO and a, a, an A2 process that they would like to remove the carbon, the nitrogen, and phosphorus. So now, new ideas for water treatment, water and waste water treatment is the try to, to use the, the simple material or the sim, simple unit to, to, to uh, clean up or to purify water and with the energy saving technology, so the membranes or the nanotech is one of them. And in addition to decompose chemicals, they would like us to recover energy, like I mentioned. The, Degradation of the chemical actually they will produce heat. Okay, and next we try this to recover those heat. And for the degradation is one kind of the, the energy production from the other way. So if we can try to think about how to recover those energy as well as just to decompose chemical names, then that would be the good ideas for us just to do the water and uh, waste water treatment. It highly related this to add to SDG. Okay, yeah. So that will be very important in the next 10 years. So just think about not just only to learn how to decompose chemical and 
needs us to learn how to recover energy as well as to to degrade chemical. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Endong. And now it's time for a uh, uh, certificate uh, handover. Maybe a committee uh, can help. Okay, uh, for Professor Endong, this is a uh, certificate for you. Thank you for your uh, uh, presentation in this uh, webinar series. Thank you, thank you. Okay. And now we can have a photo session, please. Um, okay, thank you, Mr. Echo. Now I will take a picture of the participant. And from the participant, we'll have an turn on the camera. Uh, you can turn on the camera first. Okay, uh, for the participant and in slide one, please be ready and let me take a picture in one, two, three. Uh, okay, now on the next slide, one, two, three. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Andong, once again. Uh, big. Uh, uh, respect uh, for you for today. And now I give uh, the time uh, to the committee, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Rui Andong for the wonderful talks and also to Dr. Eko for accompanying us on the last session. Once again, I would like to remind everyone who is participating in this webinar to fill out the attendance form that has already been sent via chat box. Time flies so fast without realizing we have reached the end of our webinar. But don't worry, this is not our last goodbye. We still have one more webinar left that will discuss about green cities towards the sustainable development goals or SDGs, less plastic, more lives that will be held, held on Saturday, October 16, 2021. So everyone, don't forget to join our, our next event. Before we end this webinar, I would like to say thank you to all the speakers for the knowledge that already been given, to moderator that has led today's discussion, to our sponsors, English First and Chito Mask for the support through this event, and also to all the participants for attending this webinar from beginning until the end. I'm Asha, as your host for today, officially signing off. Sorry for the inconvenience during today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. See you on the next event. Stay safe, stay healthy, and goodbye. Bye. Thank you for all and for this. Bye.